Well, kia ora tato, just uh, beginning our hui by acknowledging the mana whenua of this land in which we stand and um, kicking off our hui with uh, karakia. So we're going to get kicking into this today because we've got a uh, busy agenda. So I'm going to start with the apologies. So we have got apologies from uh, Mia Fano, Councillor Randall, Councillor Winera for... Uh, for early departure, and then we've got Councillor Calvert for absence. Do I have a seconder for those apologies? Uh, Councillor McNulty. Cool. Please vote using your remote. Right. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, now we're going to move on to com. Oh no, we're not. Uh, so, Aroha mai. This is the way we're starting off our year. Efficiency. Councillor Chan. Call carried. Awesome. All right. Uh, conflict of interest declarations. I call on any members to declare any conflicts they may have for this week. Oh, okay, okay to buy. Uh, any items not on the agenda? I don't think there are any. So, sweet. Uh, I don't think I have to move that. No. All right, public participation, awesome. All right, so we've got a pretty fulsome morning of public participation. I wanna thank everyone for coming to share their... Um... Oh yeah, okay, cool. Um, confirmation of minutes, so... I move that we accept the minutes from our last hui. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Matthews, cool. Use your remote to vote. <laughs> Councillor Wienetta. Cool. Awesome. All right. Now we're going to move on to public participation. So I would like to welcome Graham Clark, who will be representing the Wellington Residents Coalition, talking about the water and volumetric charging for water. Kia ora, Graham. You've got 10 minutes to speak to us this morning, and if you would like to answer any questions from the committee, you'll just need to leave that time within your 10 minutes. So over to you. Population higher. Contain water. Current citizen. Land. Of November twenty twenty. That's a loss of three. Thank you. 
private leaks of 20. One in every hundred. Increasingly leaking. Excessive water cause leaks and good if the water pressure is top of a hill. When the a price for the volume of water you That would have cost them courage to, to be Thank you. 
Bolesh and water can fix it. Wellington water. There is no reason. Rainwater in Wellington a year. Churn water. As well. Time is coming. Brilliant. Kilda Graham, thank you very much for that submission. No, but um, you didn't leave us with any um, question as to your stance on this issue. So thank you so much um, for coming and talking to us today. Great submission. Uh, next up, we've got Deepak Nair, who will be representing the road-worn upcyclers, talking about the multi, talking about N on oh no, a <laughs> multi-ethnic advisory panel. Cool. So Deepak, you've got ten minutes to speak to us, and if you'd like to take some questions, if there are any, you'll need to leave time within that ten minutes. Kia ora. Kia ora. Um, this submission comes under the mandate of uh, Social, Cultural, and Economic Committee. According to 2018 census, 10% of Wellington's population follow a faith other than Maori belief system, atheism, or Christianity. Almost a fifth of Wellington's population was born in a country that has English as a second language of, um, out of the Pacific region. And almost a third of Wellington, Wellingtonians speak, uh, Engli um, speak languages that are not English, Tereo, sign language, or Pacific languages. I believe that it is the duty of this council to not only cater to second generation migrants, refugees, and recent immigrants, but also people who are on work visas and family visas because they pay taxes and rents and use the public amenities. Migrants, refugees, and other ethnic minorities have starkly different upbringings and needs. At present, some of these demands are catered without coordination across different organizations and groups and these communities um, are not represented around the council table. Wellington City Council currently has five advisory groups, Accessibility Advisory Group, Environmental Reference Group, Pacific Advisory Group, Tagadapui, Rainbow Advisory Council, and Youth Council. Auckland has 11 advisory panels, and an ethnic panel is one of them. And Palmerston North Council also has one. In preparation for the submission, I have had chats with some of the city councillors, and there are three main streams of feedback uh, that I received, which are as follows. Number one, inclusion of ethnic advisory panel into an established colonial institution probably is not the right way to go about it. My response to this view would be minorities like the Pacifica people or differently able community have a space within this colonized institution, and it's doing them wonders, and we won't want ethnic people to miss out on it. 
It would give the historically marginalized community more power to action, inclusion, and representation. Uh, we wouldn't want an outside entity to represent a whole minority group, such as youth or rainbow community, because of lack, possible lack of transparency in procedures and risk of miscommunication. It shouldn't be the case with ethnic minorities either. The second stream of feedback was uh, Multicultural Council Wellington, an organization uh, outside the council, does an amazing job at coordinating with the ethnic communities. Uh, my response to that is um, uh, Multicultural Council Wellington is an important organization uh, within the rich tapestry of uh, Wellington, just as pertinent as uh, the Interfaith Council and the change makers. Um, they are great at arranging cultural programs, candidate representation, and spreading the message about uh, unity and diversity. Uh, but it is a membership-based um, exclusive organization with closed meetings to be a part of which one needs to be part of an, another organization. Um, and they don't really contribute much to council's plans or processes like council bylaw amendments or public submissions towards, let's say, let's get Wellington moving, draft district plan, three waters or Poniki promise. The third uh, stream of feedback that I got was um, how do we include such vast diversity just like um, Taka Tapui Council and the accessibility group, this, pans this panel would not be able to include every single diverse individual. The Ministry for Ethnic Communities website has a list of around 100 different ethnic organizations in Wellington. By the virtue of arranging a couple of public meetings last year, I have gathered um, uh, the names of approximately 50 more organizations, and I'm sure there are much more out there um, and this advisory panel that can invite as many of them as possible and democratically elect representatives from amongst the people. This depository of information would be a central and open location for migrants, refugees, and city councillors and officers to access. What would be the mandate of this advisory panel be? Um, they will hold uh, integrated panel sessions, developing and driving the panel's work program and presentation to the council committees. They would engage with uh, council control organizations, public forums, and external ethnic organizations. The Ethnic People's Advisory Panel would advise uh, to the Wellington City Council based on panel members' experiences uh, living as people from ethnic cultures to help the council improve outcomes for their community. This panel would also provide advice and input to Wellington City Council on matters that would be of significance to ethnic communities, including transport, housing, community safety, facilities network, council bylaws, and electoral participation. A resolution was made two years ago when Takatapui Rainbow Advisory Council was established about establishing an ethnic advisory panel. The resources invested in this panel would be minimal, and the effects would be intergenerational and long-lasting. This panel would not seek preference for ethnic communities, but would endeavor for equality, equity, and representation. I implore you, at least one of you, to put forward a motion towards establishing or exploring possibilities of establishing an ethnic people's advisory panel as um, a resolution was passed two years ago. What I would like to do is come back with a more detailed document, if required, uh, on how to implement such an idea. If you need anything else to proceed, um, like a petition or something, I'm more than happy to do that as well. Uh, last but not the least, I would like to thank um, Youth Council and Pacific Council for letting me observe them. They were very gracious, and thank you very much for listening to me. Any questions? Thank you, Deepak. Uh, so you. we've got one question from Councillor Chung. Hey. 
Thank you. Thank you, Deepak, um, coming up here. I'm the, um, the council representative on the Multicultural Council, and I've been to meetings and I've discussed um, all these issues that you've actually mentioned regarding the district plan, Panaki Ponaki, um, and how that affects them, and I've asked for input into um, how they feel about these situations. So I will continue to um, brief them on what we're doing. And so I, I believe that we are actually offering, the council is actually offering the support and, and liaising with them. Um, the sorry the um, the second item is um, I see that you've actually applied to be a member on the Multicultural Council. I will talk to the president um, today and I'll ask him about I the ask status a of this. Question? Did you have so, a question? So I can yeah I'll, I will actually do these things. So I think that I will cover all these things that you actually put on here. Thank you very much Councilor. for all your work. I really appreciate it. But I still think that um, just one person shouldn't have the responsibility of carrying um, the needs for the whole community. So I guess it would be nice to, you know, um, give that power to the whole community. But thank you for your work, and okay. I really appreciate it. Okay. Any other questions? Good point. And I'll just remind councillors that we have an opportunity to ask submitters questions. It's not a, an opportunity to respond to what they're saying. Otherwise, I'm sure we'd all like to have that input. Uh, Poe Wheelers. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I also picked up that you have applied to the Multicultural Council of Wellington to be a member of that organisation. And they're very good at representation. It's, why would you not just wait to be a part of that? I waited seven months. I'm still waiting. Uh, so, Māori, to have a presentation, we've waited nearly 200 years. Sorry, it's not I'm funny. not here to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my suggestion is just to stay in touch with um, the multicultural. I, I know the mahi that they do and the president, and they do really great work. And I, I, I think rather than try and re-establish something else, that it might be preferable. Okay, all right. I think we're going off track with the questions. Uh, I still have one and a half minutes. Any other questions? Uh, sorry, Deepak, um, there are no other questions from the <laughs> Councillor Randall. Thank you. Um, Questions, so, please, by the way. Yes, of course. So thank you very much for your presentation and supporting information. Um, you make a compelling case. And in terms of what you uh, think that the, the uh, this advisory group, do, do you think that the advisory group would, uh, what, what would the alignment be with the other ones, obviously the Pacifica and uh, other groups, do you think it would be complementary to them, or and how much would you think the, the, you would need to work with them as well as working? Most with definitely, the it's one of the questions that was raised yesterday at Pacific Advisory Group as well about how they would liaise with other um, um, other advisory groups as well. But um, that would be along with the fact that ethnic advisory group would be working. Uh, to cater to the needs of ethnic population that would probably, I don't know much about it, this is just what I think, is catering to the ethnic communities. There are 131 different ethnicities, other people, other beliefs, other religions. So there are different needs. So basically catering to them, going to them, talking to them, and uh, coming up with different solutions that are not um, inherently um, talked about uh, in the con on the council tables. And I, I also, um, Liz is, um, question, I guess, touching upon that, like, um, they do amazing work. There's nothing taking away from them. It's, it's an amazing organization. They've been around for a while. Um, it's just about, um, it, they don't really represent, you know, the whole just community, another, another the voice. whole diaspora. Kapai. Kapai. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah, Good luck. Thank you very much. Okay. Good luck. All the best. All right, next we've got Ali Forrest uh, from the Orfidal Bay Residents Association coming to talk to us about the residual waste paper on the Southern Landfill Extension. Kia ora, Ali. You've got 10 minutes, and if you want to answer any questions, leave time within that 10 minutes. Uh, kia ora. Thanks very much for, for letting me speak to you. Um, so firstly, we recognise and appreciate that the Council is going in the right direction with its emphasis on zero waste and real efforts to manage the transition to a circular economy in Wellington. OBRA, um, the Ophiro Bay Residents Association, has been part of working groups around the southern landfill options and waste minimisation, including the ongoing residual waste working group up at the landfill. And we've had constructive dis discussions with council officers who I'd like to thank for being transparent and responsive. 
Um, we feel it's very important um, that community groups are involved in council decision making in this way. Um, there may be only a few of us from our communities with the time to engage uh, like this, but with the council, but we do feed back to a large part of our communities so that all residents are up to date with what's going on and have the opportunity to input. Um, on the subject of this piggyback option business case, we don't have a quarrel with the business case that you're being asked to, to approve, but I do want to state or restate a few points around it that are important to the Orfiro Bay community as the group probably the most immediately affected by the Southern Landfill. Um, first, firstly, um, no more exten extensions. We agreed to the piggyback option going ahead on condition that this would be the last ever extension, giving the Southern Landfill another 20 or even 30 years. And councillors have explicitly endorsed this in the LTP and here, and we're very happy with that. However, councils change, and it, it's a risk that this resolution will, during the next 30 years, get thrown out the window. Um, so we want to guarantee that Kerry's Gully won't be filled any further up. Um, and we made a submission to the district plan for a redesignation of the Kerry's Gully area so that the remainder of it, um, which is a very large area, it's the whole of Kerry's Gully, um, changes from a sanitary waste designated area to reserve. And this seems to be the best way to guarantee that landfilling doesn't continue for another century up the gully. The district plan is going to be considered separately, I know, early this year, but I just wanted to remind you all um, of our view. Related to this is um, the date for closure of the landfill. Um, we have a slightly different perspective from the council, who um, sees the drastic reduction of waste that we're all working towards. Um, allowing an attenuated life for the landfill to beyond 2047. OBRA is actually keen to see an end date for the landfill rather than an indefinite life, however um, restricted. It's only when it's actually closed that the valley can be finally made good and become part of the beautiful regenerating environment between Zealandia and the sea. Um, the next point is um, no out-of-town rubbish. There's a risk that when the piggyback option gives the southern landfill a new lease of life and other landfills around Wellington come up to capacity in the next few years, such as spices, there may be a temptation to divert all or some of that to the southern landfill. Um, that's been mentioned in past papers and implied in the Q&As, I think, for this session, and it's not acceptable to OBRA the southern landfill shouldn't accept waste from out of town, whether or not there are financial penalties or incentives. At least um, the commercial waste ought to be prohibited, as trucking waste from the motorway through the top of Tiaro and through Brooklyn, which are very um, crowded inner city suburbs, is unacceptable. It shouldn't be happening now, and it should, be, should not be an expedient official decision in a few, few years' time. Related to this, um, uh, but not relevant exactly to the business case of the two private landfills um, next to the southern landfill, um, there should be better control over them, T and T and C and D. They are a large part of the problem with traffic, litter, pollution of the stream, muddy roads, um, litter in the marine reserve, but they're not adequately monitored nor are the conditions of their consents enforced, and we want to see this improve from both regional and city councils. Um, the fifth point is the financial model. The, the, this business case is based on the current financial model, whereby the landfill gate fees supply a large part of costs for collection services, etc. Um, and as waste is reduced, this won't work any longer. So we are keen to see the new financial model um, whereby other income can be generated, hopefully not from rates, but recycling, repurposing, composting, businesses like that. And I, I think it's going to be presented with the next LTP in 2024. Um, and my last point is the ecological mitigation and offsetting. So 
uh, this business case is to do with a relatively small area that's going to be excavated for the, the piggyback option, which we're satisfied is going to be made good. However, we think the council needs to look further at the whole site and ensure that the effects on it from all previous incursions on the re regenerating bush and the native fauna are protected. Since the last cons resource consent, the things have changed a lot. Um, the halo effect from Zealandia has improved the bird life and a corridor from Zealandia to sea is opening up. Residents have been avidly trapping on their sections and the surrounding bush has been regenerating and kiwis have actually been reintroduced not that far away. So the problem of rats, possums and mustelids, encouraged by the waste, there's no argument about that, is, if anything, more urgent. And we'd like to see the plan for enhanced trapping or bait stations and monitoring in Carey's Gully, replanting and the continuous cleanup of plastics flying around or in the streams. Um, and lastly, a, just a general point related to this. We, we do ask councillors to bear in mind that the Orfiro Bay community has been accepting the waste from the whole city for decades and we've been mitigating these effects by planting, trapping pests, eliminating weeds, clearing the beach up and clearing the stream of rubbish washed down from the tips. And in return, it seems reasonable that resources are put into protecting us and our environment from its effects. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, awesome. Um, I've got a question for you that I'll kick off with. If, and if anyone else has questions, please put your hand up in advance. Um, so, Ali, um, sorry if I missed it, but did you guys have a date in mind that you might want for that um, end date of the landfill? Well, we did have a... A, a date in mind, which was 20 years after the uh, the uh, um, start of the extension, which mm. is 2046. But I understand that um, you know m maybe um, a bit extra time is required for um, allowing the waste to um, special types of waste, perhaps to be. Um, um, taken there rather than general rubbish. Mm. So I, I hadn't specified a, an actual date, but certainly, you know, 20 to 30 years, I would have thought would be yep. reasonable. Cool, thank you. Uh, Councillor Abdurrahman. Kia ora, Eile. Thank you so much for your submission. And one is the question uh, Tamata already asked. The second one is, it seems we are saying for us to look at the special plan which of, uh, OBRA submitted and to make that as a precondition to vote to today's paper. Is that why you are requesting? Um, no, we, we don't have a special plan for this particular paper. Um, the, so we haven't got any amendments for it but we're just talking about the implications of it. I'm talking about the submission that you made to the special this, plan. The district plan? The, dis the district yes. plan about the gully, uh, the curry gully. Special, so de the designation yep. change, yes. Do you want Sorry. that to be a precondition to make today's decision? I, I don't think it, it can be, but I mean, that would be ideal. Yeah. But I, I think it's down to the district plan discussions later uh, this year, isn't it? Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ali, for being with us this morning. Thank you. Uh, next, we've got Martin Payne representing Friends of All Feed All Stream and on the same topic. Kia ora, Martin. Kia ora. Um, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I bring greetings from the Friends of Afero Stream. I'm Martin Payne, and I'm the coordinator for FOOS. This year, our group uh, celebrates our 20th year of activity, having planted over 30,000 trees and worked with the community to protect and restore the Ofero stream to life. Despite these efforts, water quality continues to diminish in the catchment. This is painful but it has not diminished our determination to do better. Our journey with the Southern Landfill Extension began in 2012. 
Back then, it envisaged a 120-year-plus filling t time frame that cut the very heart out of the stream, a ferro stream network in the valley above the existing landfill. This consent application barely gave the stream a nod, stating that the environmental effects of the proposed activity would be minimal. You can imagine our opposition. So today, it is really stra strange to be stand standing, or maybe sitting, here in support of the proposed LEPO landfill extension, not because we like the idea of continuing to landfill, but because we see a bigger picture, a better plan to address the real issue, and that is that we are collectively wasteful. The launch of the Zero Waste Strategy yesterday is timely. A plan coming together, a change in direction, a transition that will diminish our need to fill the stream valleys and the wetlands with our junk. We support the SLEPO proposal as it is smaller, smarter, and with proactive management will support our transition towards zero waste and reducing the city's carbon footprint. Getting there has been hard work. I commend, I commend the council for grappling with the underlying issues of waste, recognising the need for change and developing a new understanding and practice around working with the community. We now have a, sludge, a sewage sludge minimisation project underway and another, a number of developing initiatives to extricate ourselves from the hole that we have dug. I would particularly like to acknowledge the determined mahi of the Deputy Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor Foon and Councillor Panett in this regard. So congratulations to you all but I encourage you not to sit back in your seats. There is much work, there is much work, there is much work to be done. With regard to the presented business case, we encourage you as councillors to look closely at the funding model. We are concerned that this model will not be self-sustaining as waste volumes fall. Again, a smart and engaging plan will allow time to transition to a more sustainable funding model fit for the long term. We are disappointed that this business plan does not reveal its heart. It presents a lot of information about decision-making processes, budgets for construction, reducing risk, which are all important. But it does not express how we collectively plan to look after the environment and the local community that will continue to receive the city's waste. I am struck by the generosity of the local community, both in its willingness to contribute their time and energy to finding solutions to our waste problem, and a moral compass that accepts the continuing op operation of the landfill within limits, rather than demanding that this waste be dumped in somebody else's backyard or stream, mm -hmm. and, and in that way closing its eyes to the problem. I would like to encourage this committee to recipro reciprocate this generosity by passing an additional motion that recognises a special duty of care to the local community and the environment of the Ilfira. I wish this proposed landfill a long life, as I believe this will be a mark of our collective success. We move together, we, we move forward together, making a better future for those that come after us. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Martin. Do we have any questions for Martin? Mm. Uh, one question, why are you so awesome? Uh, from <laughs> Councillor Matthews. Uh, hey, I'd just like to say on behalf of our council, yep. congratulations on 20 years of uh, Friends of All Federal Stream, and thank you for joining us here this morning, that, Martin. Thank you. I, I understand that there may be um, a... Um, 
added motion yep. related to our yep. request for acknowledgement of the community and the environment that we're working with. There so, shall be, and yep. also um, we will be discussing that one straight after morning tea, so if you want to hang around and have a cup of tea with us, and then you can stay and listen to the debate um, and that acknowledgement of your work uh, after the morning tea break. Thank you Which very will much. be um, soon. Cool. Kia ora, Martin. <laughs> And finally, we have Felicity Wong, who is representing Historic Places Wellington on, and uh, Felicity's talking to the submission on the RMA reform. Okay, uh, kia ora, and look, congratulations to all of you. You fought hard, um, won election campaigns, and you're here, and that's great. Um, I'm speaking this morning because I don't think many people in the community kind of understand the legislation and in particular the RMA reforms. And what I wanted to say is that we're all part of a great community endeavour. You know, the folks who have spoken to us this morning about Afira Bay, the landfill, the water, the multicultural, you know, all of you representing um, community voices. <clears throat> and I think that's really important because what's happening is there's a restructure going on about local government, and you, our local representatives, are being made redundant. <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure that you understand this. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so I support you, all of you. I support all of you, the ones that I don't even campaign to support in elections, but I support the fact that you exist, and I support the fact that we come here and we can talk to you about these issues. So. Last year, three waters was taken away from 67 local councils and given to four water entities. The Natural and Built Environment Bill takes resource allocation away from 67 councils and replaces you with 14 committees. And Historic Places Wellington looks to history. You would expect us to think about the past. And in the early days, um, these were the waters and lands of Ngāti Tara and Ngāti Ira and Ngāti Kahunganui and Rangatahi and Mua Opoko, and then the northern tribes, Ngāti Toa and Taranaki Whanui, established relationships with the New Zealand com Company to set up the town of Britannia out in um, what's now Petoni, and then Port Nicholson when that flooded, which is something that our colleagues in Auckland are really struggling with. You know, as that legitimate or, or non-legitimate non transfer of land crept north, um, and we developed a system of provincial government. And the Wellington province str stretched from Port Nicholson to Napier. And from 1853, the first superintendent, Isaac Featherston, was responsible for rules and around development and a single budget stretching from Hawke's Bay to Poniki. Um, what's happening is that that province is being recreated um, and local people have fought hard to um, insert themselves and your communities into the big decisions about resource allocation. Um, and it sapped communities for years. This bill, the Natural and um, Built Environment Bill, um, creates the Wellington province again. Um, and it means that the Ministry for the Environment makes the national planning framework more than 100 regional policy statements and regional and district plans will be consolidated into 14 plans. The bill amalgamates the resource allocation of existing local government, the plans for Manawatu, the three plans of the Wairapa, those of Kapiti, Pororoa, Heart Cities and Wellington will be merged into one. Major decisions about the kind of cities that we live in, <clears throat> Palmerston North, Masterton, all the mountains, lakes and rivers and rural areas between will be outlined by a single regional planning committee. One committee will rule them all. One person from Wellington will sit on that committee to make a single regional spatial strategy and a single natural and built environment plan. This 850 page bill takes away from local communities, from Wellington, the ability to make a Wellington district plan and it compresses us into a provincial government sized entity. An independent hearing panel will complete a fast track process to consider submissions against the plan. It removes the right to participate for local communities by having no mandatory hearings. If the regional planning committee <coughs> accepts the panel, panel's recommendations, there's no appeals to the environment court. And this result 
of a merger of local authority roles <clears throat> means that Wellington's input will be limited to a statement of community outcomes and regional environmental outcomes. The system of outcomes for the amalgamation do not include references to the built environment or to the quality of our built environment in our cities. Uh, and Wellington, let me just talk a bit about the history of Wellington. It's a really progressive city. You know, this was an early adopter of the idea of sustainable cities. It was quick to declare a climate emergency and to commit to becoming carbon zero. It committed to being a compact city, uh, and many years ago, it removed the requirement for car parking in CBD buildings, leading the way to affordable inner city apartment living. Um, it has not had single family zoning like Auckland does. It's always had extra accommodation on private sites. And only last year did the government directives force other cities to adopt the kind of plans and programs that this city has had for 100 years. <laughs> Wellington partnered with Iwi early <clears throat> and wants to explore unpopular issues like carbon charging. You know, the rest of the region is not ready for Wellington. Then <laughs> we're ahead, we're so far ahead of um, these other neighboring cities uh, and we don't want to be held back by them. Look, I could talk about the specific proposals, the definition of cultural heritage, which Historic Places Wellington supports in the bill. We support the proposals around specified cultural heritage, but we have very big concerns about uh, cultural heritage that is not specified, i.e. non-category one heritage. And Wellington, in recent years, has lost two category one buildings um, and a third the Gordon Wilson Flats, which was so important to the second Labour government, is currently being delisted by Victoria University through the um, hearing panel process, but we've objected to that. Um, so really important issues are happening. Um, Sub-regional plans would be a really good idea, uh, and I think that's something that your staff have recommended. So look, take an interest. Um, I think it's, it's a really big deal. Let me say that uh, the system of provincial government in New Zealand only lasted for 20 years, and then it was abolished. I think we're going down that same track again. <laughs> and I hazard to say that this bill will be consigned to the barbecue or the umu, um, you know, in due course. Thank you. Thanks, Felicity. We've got two questions for you this morning. So, Councillor Wienerda. Kia ora. Thank you for your submission. Um, just to clarify your stance, do you see a way, particularly with regard to the Natural and Built Environments Bill, that this proposal could work for Wellington, or is your ultimate preference the status quo? No, my, my preference is not the status quo, because I actually feel taking off my historic places Wellington hat and thinking about the environment, it's quite clear that without baseline limits to environmental degradation, we haven't made it as a country. You know, so bad stuff has happened because we haven't, like other countries, if you go to the European Union, they have these standards, you know, you can't emit more than this. You can't release more than that amount of, you know, polluted water or whatever. They have a standards-based system. We didn't go for that. So I was a young diplomat in London, and I had to go to the UK government, this is in 1980-something, and say, hey, New Zealand has had this incredible idea, it's going to be effects-based. They just looked at me like, are you crazy? <laughs> and so it has turned out to be in the sense that we have built an enormous industry of very high paid people who run the system. And I know from a grassroots organization, it's really difficult. You know, I'm ringing around trying to find experts at $500 an hour who can support my case in the district plan. Because if you don't have experts and lawyers fighting each other, you, you don't have a very good way of um, operating environmental limits. So it's been a failure. It's been a failure. Okay, so, sorry. So, if, so if what I, instead? <laughs> yeah, so just with regard to some of the specific provisions, you, you mentioned a concern that Wellington might be held back by the rest of the region. Do you feel that greater representation and perhaps elected representation from Wellington to the Regional Planning Committee would be sufficient? Or, or do you feel that is a half measure? A half measure? I think it's a pathetic measure. <laughs> I mean, for iwi, I mean, I can't speak for iwi, but can you imagine what this is going to be like? You've got one representative, or two or three on a committee for all of sort of, mm. you know, the 
lower part of the North Island. I mean, I, I just can't imagine how this is going to work, you know. You're being made redundant. And, and, and as a person who really values the, the great tapestry of what we all offer, you know, what you offer, the Green Party, the Labour Party, the Independence National Act, whatever, it's great. Awesome, thank <laughs> Sorry, you. Sorry, I feel very passionate. Oh, no, that's cool. Uh, Just really quickly, quickly this yep. following on. Yep, sure. So given the proposed structure is problematic, the current one is problematic, what kind of structure do you think would, would protect the environment, which I know you're passionate about? Well, as I say, I do, I do support, you know, I'm, this is not Historic Places Wellington, this is just me as a person speaking, but this answering your question, um, there does have to be much stricter rules about bottom lines, definitely standards. We've been working for 10 or 15 years on freshwater standards and we can't get there, you know, that's not good enough. So I, I would actually look at what other jurisdictions have, you know, I would look mm. at the Europeans for a standards-based system rather than an effects-based system, mm. which is what we've got in the RMA. Awesome. Thank you so much, Felicity, for joining us this morning. <laughs> have an awesome day. Awesome. Uh, all right, so I'm going to be reordering the agenda, so we're going to uh, go to the actions tracking and forward program papers now. I'm going to try to squeeze some things in before morning tea. Uh, so I invite Liam Hodgetts to introduce the action, Actions Tracking Paper. Thank you, Madam Chair. So take it as read. Any questions? Questions? Okay, I move. Uh, Councillor Brown second. Also. Oh, you had a question. Yeah. Sure, you can ask. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't actually understand what the point of this paper was. Could you explain to me what it's about? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So there's two papers. There's the Action Tracking um, uh, paper which effectively collects and keeps a record of a <coughs> of all of the um, decisions of council as it relates to this committee. Obviously, this has been rolled up um, from the last joining as well. And then the second report is, of course, the um, the forward program. So it gives you a sense of what's coming next. Councillor Panna. Um, I understand that the policy team is working on the program, but when are we going to have a comprehensive forward program to consider? Because I'm, I continue to be concerned about just having, you know, two months advance warning. We need to know what we're going to be doing for three years to, to plan properly. Okay, three, Madam Chair. So there is a, a, a longer term forward program we uh, talk with and share with the chairs, which we're okay to share with you. I believe, Councillor, you've seen that from the last triennium. No, no, no. Um, in it's terms of including in this report, yeah, yeah it's supposed I, I'd to be have publicly. to re defer that to Stephen MacArthur. I'm not sure whether um, that is planned to happen anytime soon, but the Dem Services team, I can take that on. Yeah, could you? Just because it has always been a publicly voted on document, so it's sure. not just sure. for a few people. Um, that's helpful. And the other thing is, look, I know this is just an evolving one with the action tracking, and it is important, but one, it's really hard to read, and two, like, there's not enough accountability. Like, there's actions on there that are months old, and I think we need to sort of, at least, sorry, it's a bit administrative, but group at least what's old so that we can go, we can call ourselves to account and say, why hasn't this been done yet? It's not it's not that effective at the moment, I don't think. So uh, can you just look at that? Because the, you're the committee with lots of actions. Thank you. Noted. For your feedback, noted, yes. Any other questions on those papers? Awesome, I move. Councillor Brown will second. Please vote with your remote. Awesome. All right, let's go to morning tea, and if you could come back in 10 minutes at 10.35, we can uh, go about our business. It's terrible. It's terrible.
Matthews to introduce the papers. Uh, so kia ora Chris, we're going to um, get an introduction on the residual waste paper for the Southern Landfill Extension Piggyback Option Business Case, so kia ora Chris. So councillors, to, to let you know what the process will be, we'll have uh, Chris giving a brief introduction to the paper and then we'll have an opportunity to ask questions and then the paper will be introduced. There may be another opportunity to ask questions of any amendments to the paper and then we will get into debate. So handing it to you, Chris. Come to the table because that mic's been a little bit um, dodgy this morning. I'd rather not be standing up. That's perfect. <laughs> okay, is it working? Yep, yeah, cool. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, the Southern Landfill Extension is a key project within the Zero Waste Strategy that it will enable us to continue to reduce, recover, recycle and safely dispose of our residual waste. The piggyback is the preferred option that was endorsed in the 22, um, 22 Annual Plan and the LTP Committee and was also the preferred option from the community consultation. $54.5 million was allocated in the current LTP period. The business case requests approval to invest $36 million in the first stages of construction, and this includes uh, contingency, and agree to amend the LTP to bring forward $16.3 million from the 29 to 31 into the 22 to 28 period to synchronise funding with the construction. And it's worth noting that the business case is aligned with the new consent, which will be operating in parallel, and is required to ensure that the council has a consented and built landfill extension in place by 2026. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Councillor Pennett. <coughs> Thank you. I was just telling you, Ridden, that when I started with waste, um, we were going to have a 100 year capacity. So we've got rid of 95. So that is excellent, <laughs> really good progress. Um, the question really is, and I mean, obviously I understand council processes, but how we really tie the organisation to the fact that we won't extend again. So the designation, if that is, um, well, if it's just bound to be only that five-year period, is that going to be enough? Plus maybe a really, really strong paper saying that, you know, we will, we will commit over the long term to finding alternatives to, to landfilling, except that really difficult. Small yeah, materials. I mean, absolutely. I mean, there's there's a resolution already that this will be our last landfill. Can we make that stronger? Because uh, that can just be overridden. Can be like another council can just say, well, we don't like that, and we're going to do something different. Well, that's really for the council to debate. Okay, but you don't have it. Sorry, it was just advice about whether there was any further process we could do just to make that commitment stronger than just one resolution. You know, a couple of words. Do you have any? So this is the, the, this paper is seeking approval for parts A and B of the landfill extension, which takes us to 2031. Uh, any further extension and um, uh, seeking further funding will require um, us to come back to, to the council for that. So uh, there's an opportunity at that stage to uh, for for council officers to do further work. Uh, into what that end date might be and potentially propose that at, uh, at that stage. Thanks. And sorry, a quick question for you, Liam. Sorry, can you just explain to me, with the district plan, is it possible through there to say, like, that's it, five years and then we need to do something different? Uh, three, Madam Chair, no, it's, it's not um, because that would relate to the resource consent issued under the plan. The, the option um, would be to, um, once the landfill is closed, is to rezone it to an appropriate post-use. Um, you know, you, you can't um, use any other mechanism than I can think of. Okay, um, so that would be another a separate plan change at a later point? Once the landfill is closed, yeah, you'd have to rezone it to, you know, an, an open space category of sorts, but um, that would be, of course, sometime in the future. So it can't be done through this current iteration of the district plan? Officers couldn't look at that? No, no, because I think if, 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 the, if the land use, for whatever reason, for any minor consents or minor variations that might be required, would have to operate under the legally under the zone. So it, it, needs, it has existing use rights as well, I suppose, we should, we should also mention. I think your question is more in perpetuity, how would you lock down yeah, the expansion yeah. of the landfill? Yeah, so That's right. um, I, can't think of, I can't think of any, it, 
you know, an act of parliament potentially, um, uh, you know, a covenant perhaps on, on the land, um, that there are options officers could explore for you. But is, is it possible then, as part of the amendment, just to add to ask for some advice about how we could lock it down a bit Can, uh, Deputy Mayor Foon has asked for advice on that kind of information and will get that information, but I think it's, are you comfortable that you'll get that information without needing an amendment? Because I'm... Well, it can just be added on to Councillor Foon's amendment. Oh, we're not going to be doing amendments on the fly today. Um, Councillor Foon, Foon, you're happy with that? Already happy. Um, with due respect, we are allowed to put amendments. Our standing order is allowed to put And so just, just in terms yep, of Yeah, and the Deputy Mayor's been working on her amendments and they're ready to go, so we'll, we'll leave them as that. I think making decisions on the fly isn't... Well, I think I am... All right, we're going to move on now. Next responding. question is Councillor Abdurman. Uh, Councillor, could you just use your microphone, please? Cool, thank you. Uh, will the current landfill, which is stage three, and the uh, future landfill, the piggy park, after closure, will be uh, will be some work in that area, or just going to be leaving and just go away? No, I mean absolutely. Though, um, once once the current landfill is closed, it will be remediated, and part of the consent condition for the um, well, for the consent we're putting forward is that it has to be remediated after as well, you know, with native plants. So we, we return to its natural state. Cool. My other question would be, if the council intends to close in 20 years' time, why it's so hard to put a date, say, 2046, we are closing, and even if it's not for some reason, not 2046, 2056, or whatever it is, why we can't give a date for it? I think the challenge there is that we are actively working to reduce our waste. So the volume is not exactly known at this point. We've had some, um, some great opportunities to remove sludge from 2026. This is obviously going to extend it. And it really depends on how the council wants to move forward with other recovery options, such as organics. If we were to remove organics out, that would certainly um, extend the life significantly. So I think it's too early at this stage when it, without the um, you know, council's decisions on, on future direction and without further um, legislation coming out through MFB, for example, through, um, through um, potentially mandating organics is not allowed into to waste streams to really make that decision. So the council intention when you, ca when you say you can't put it, the data is based on the possibility of not utilizing the whole facility by the end of that 20 years, not thinking extension of another um, landfill? Well, I mean, the council would want to utilize this investment as much as possible. And we'd also, we're also trying on the, on the same um, time to make sure that we remove as much, um, we, we put as least, as the smallest amount of residual waste into the um, tip as possible. Deputy Mayor Foon. Um, kia ora, Chris. Just, um, I did put this through on the Q&A, but I don't think it was responded to too well. But just the, um, num on number 33, climate ch change impact and considerations, it says no change from the existing landfill in regard to carbon emission impacts. So, um, yeah, just wanted to query that because I think that was one of the drivers. Yeah, well... It would be a reduction in, in emissions. I think. I suppose what we're thinking about in that case is when we're actually building the landfill. The land, the business case itself is about building a landfill. Building a landfill in itself is, is not going to reduce carbon emissions. But what will reduce carbon emissions is how we manage the landfill. And you know, we've made great progress, particularly in how we um, we've been recently reducing our CO2 emissions. So I'm confident that it's it is about how you manage the landfill and, how, and what you recover and then how you repurpose that. Great. Thank Councillor you. Wienera. Kia ora. Yeah. Um, how would you respond to one of our submitters' concerns regarding predator mitigation um, based on a potential increase uh, following the extension? Can, can, so can you ask a question again? Sorry. How would you respond to the concerns of one of our submitters regarding predator mitigation in the areas around this, uh, land, this proposed landfill extension? Through the chair, um, <clears throat> we are working with the working group on uh, vector control plans uh, as part of the resource consent application. We're also working with our urban ecology team to ensure that we're doing everything we can to mitigate um, uh, the risk of uh, rodents or, or other predators. Cool. 
All right. Uh, seeing as there are no further questions, I will pass over to the Deputy Mayor to introduce the paper. Thank you, Chris and Stefan, for that introduction. Well, kia ora tato. Um, I'm sure many of my um, colleagues from the last term are really excited to continue the ongoing discussion on how we deal with our waste for Wellington City. Um, but I do want to thank you all for your patience and support as we do this. Um, thank you, Councillor Panett, for your um, work in the, in the past as well. But I think when I came on to Council last term, I didn't really understand that we had a big landfill plan to press into Kerry's Gully. And it seemed like a very hard uh, journey ahead to actually try and change that from happening. And then by a... Um, you know, during COVID, we had our pipes burst, our sewage pipes burst, sewage pipes burst, burst. <laughs> Peter Piper picked a, yeah, um, at, at Mount Albert, which meant that we were trucking our sewage sludge around to the landfill. And the fact that we were putting sewage sludge into the landfill was one of the main reasons given as to why we couldn't reduce our waste. So that became a silver lining because that made us realise that that system we had, pumping our waste underground two kilometres to the landfill was not sustainable and not resilient and not a good thing for Wellington to be doing. So it really shone a light on, on how we were disposing, the, the amount of waste we were, we were disposing of and the way that we were um, processing our sewage sludge. So this is, I guess this... Um, request to um, sign off our business case as part of a big piece of the jigsaw puzzle to really going forward here. Um, so we've had the sludge project, which you signed off before Christmas. Then we've also had the zero waste strategy, which we have just launched yesterday. Um, and then we've got today the signing off. We've approved, we went through the process of looking at different ways, different technical solutions that we could possibly deal with our waste. And the community came back with a smaller landfill extension was the best opportunity for us. So it's not something I want to be promoting or excited about a new landfill extension, but I am because it is the best way to help us go on our zero waste journey. And that's why we're here today. And that's why I'm supporting it and asking you to support it as well. Um, so we've got, you know, there are a few queries with this, but I feel comfortable around the risks that we're, that officers have, have got these under control. The main um, challenge for me is the leachate leaking and actually the impact that the landfill has on the community and the environment, which is what our speakers today came to point out. And I really do want to tell you that um, Councillor Abdurrahman and myself put up with at all of our um, community meetings um, constant uh, complaints from the community about the smell of the landfill, about the um, trucks that charge through Tiaro up the hill, um, about the dirt from the wheels of the trucks and the constant rubbish that falls out and embeds itself in the stream of our hour there. So we are not happy about having the landfill in our community. But I think we've heard from the community today that they are willing, which is a really big thing, and I want to honour them today, to continue with this journey for the greater good, that we go on a collective journey together rather than send our waste off somewhere else where we don't have an idea of what what we're doing to keep it here so we are aware and we are looking it in the face. And I hope that they will come to continually remind us of how we are progressing. So on that, I do just want to um, thank the community, particularly Ali and Martin, for coming in today. And Martin, thank you for your reminder. We will not rest, but we may need you behind us to make sure we carry on with this. And Ali, thank you for representing the Ofero community. Your community really does bear the brunt of the landfill, but we thank you all for your vision and that your care. So we've got two amendments, actually. Can you, Letitia, would you mind scrolling up? So we have put in another one actually in um, to support Ali's request, but the, the number seven was about 
um, thank you for Martin for helping us with this, that we see ourselves as custodians. And this, the reason why we have this, that Wellington City Council has a duty of care for the community and the environment, is that in the past it hasn't really been the case, that there hasn't been the respect towards both of those by this organisation. And we really want to see Wellington City Council showing leadership and ongoing leadership in this space and making sure we care. And in number eight, we are asking officers to do more work to come up with a suggested date for the closure of the southern landfill. This council has already agreed last term that we wanted this to be the final landfill. Kia ora, Councillor Matthews. I'm happy to... Um, Oh, um, we had a request to um, make sure that that was importance rather than duty of care from our legal team. That's correct, yep. Madam Chair, so uh, Letitia's just working on that uh, amendment now. Great. Um, so where was I? So, so I... I appreciate it is very hard for us to set a date right here and now but I think that if we're on a tra trajectory to understanding what, when and where that might look like we can stay vigilant for the next term and the term after to making sure that that is the, the pathway we are on. So um, just I cannot wholeheartedly thank the Ofero community, Brooklyn community, Friends of Ofero Stream, Waste Free Wally, and our officers for really working on this to get us to this place. This could be a big fight if we wanted it to be, but it is not. We are working together, and that is why we have a resolve today. So I look forward to your support, but I also look forward to your support in working with the community and mana whenua for a better outcome going forward in the future. And I'll ask, um, thank, uh, Councillor Abdurrahman will second today. Thank you so much, Laurie. And I think it's really interesting. We come very, very long way. I want to uh, acknowledge the hard work of all the councillors, especially to Laurie and uh, Ayana. I think the community fought very, really big time. And one thing I want this house to understand is that the community, the Brooklyn residents, of Bay residents, they have gone through so much because of this landfill, but they are still open for the sake of the greater Wellingtonians. And we need to look after them, we need to support them. There is so much they have gone through. They submitted, you can see through the submissions. Today they are here. That's why, as a councillors, we wanted to include the, their suggestions. So we need to be listening to the community. That's why the officers work very hard, in including those things. And we are expecting at some stage for uh, officers to come up with the date for the closure. And uh, from the community, Brooklyn uh, Resident Association, Carl, thank you so much for the hard work you did, including other uh, Brooklyn residents. From Ophiro Bay Resident Associations, Ali and Eugene, your, your job is really, really great, appreciated by councillors. Gerard, I do understand you wanted the closure to happen now, and I wish that is what we all wanted, but in, in real world, that we have to sometimes compromise, and I think this is something really good for the community, even though it's not, well, it's not an ideal one. One thing I want the officers to consider in the future is the car that is coming from motorway, which is you know, Ellie mentioned in her submission is a big, big issue for the community. Just all those trucks going through Brooklyn roads. Community seeing that every day is not really fun. And they parking on, on the other side, on Ophira Bay, which is really, really dangerous. Jed can tell you, councillors, if you want to chat to him as well. So I think officers need to be caring for this community, look after for their willingness to go through all this in accepting this uh, landfill extension. And thank you, Laurie, for working hard on this. And thank you so much. That's all I want to say. Who would like to speak to this? Yeah, I've got Councillor Panner. Anybody else? Call Councillor Panner. Just be brief. Uh, the Deputy Mayor sent me a text yesterday and said, do you mind not seconding? And I was like, thank God. I was like... <laughs> Because, you know, where you talk about swallowing rats in politics, this is one, a very, very, very large one. Um, but look, as I said, it was a 100-year capacity. <laughs> and so getting it down to five is actually something I could swallow. And, and well, 2031, I hope, 
mm, yeah, okay. Um, well, that's what we should be aiming for. And certainly when I spoke to officers in the early days, at least getting to 10 years was acceptable because that would give us the, the, the time frame. Um, it has been an incredibly slow process, though. I was just speaking to my colleague that, you know, I got money to do some critical work through in 2018, and it hasn't even been started. So we are still behind on creating those alternative systems um, in spite of the very good work of this council and um, previous council. Um, so, um, look, you know, I'll vote for it because I think it's a responsible thing to do, even though I did get through something in the, um, the regional waste plan that we would actually look at amalgamating our landfills. The fact that we have three in the region is deeply problematic, and I think Councillor Foon and I want to have, have another go at that one um, because they're, they're money makers, which is why councils like them, but um, they're, they're really bad things. So I hope that we can... Um, through this further advice, thank you, Councillor Foon, for including that now on this day, not last night, so it's good that we're being flexible, um, that, that we'll come back with some further advice about really how to tie the city to not extending the landfill. The community, as you've rightly pointed out, have put up with enough and are taking one for the whole city because who wants to live next to a dump? Um, so if we can tie ourselves to that and really put the foot down on the pier door about tr creating the organic collection service, getting the, the processing plant up, converting the dump into a resource recovery network is my dream, and I hope that that's, what we, that's where we need to be going um, and because there should really be very, very little waste. And even in the great future, hopefully there will not be a single product on this planet that cannot be put back into the environment, into the economy, because we've d developed such an, a sophisticated circular economy. That's a dream, so still we will need some landfilling capacity in the region, but at least if we can really get it down and say, look, no, no more C and D. Like A and B is enough, um, and in five years we should have sorted ourselves out. Kia ora. Councillor Young. Uh, so, briefly as ever, um, first of all, I would just like to say I would like to congratulate or commend the management of the current landfill because it is really incredibly well managed, uh, all of it, the tip shop, the green part, the whole lot. So um, that in passing, you know, it is a bit of an evil necessity. Um, so the, my real point is that I can't support number eight because I, I don't think we should be tying future councils down. I know it's only suggested, but I feel it's not right. I wouldn't want a council from the 1980s to dictate to us what we do. The world changes, and I think we should leave it up to the, if there is local government then, uh, for them to decide what they do. Right of reply. I urge you all to support this business case for the residual waste for Wellington City and so we can get on with the zero waste strategy and make it a resource recovery centre in the future. Kia ora. Great, okay, so we're gonna take one to seven unless anyone would like anything else separate. Cool, so one to seven, so that's the six original officer recommendations. The seventh uh, is the acknowledgement of Orfidor, the community, and there's also been a slight tweak to add iwi in there um, as well. So we're voting on one to seven, and we'll get a division on that. Awesome, and then we will vote on eight, which is about the uh, investigating a closure date for the Southern Landfill. Uh, so that carries with 11-4 and six against. Do we want a division on that one as well? Yep, let's get a division on that too, great. Okay, awesome. All right, now we're going to move on to the next paper, which is the submissions on the Water Services Legislation Bill and the Water Services Economic Efficiency and Consumer Protection. So I'll invite Chris back up to the table to introduce that paper to us. I'll just, just wait for the chair. Yeah. Kira. 
Back again. Um, last year, <laughs> this one should be good. Last year, the council submitted on the water services entity bill, which became an act in December 2022. This paper includes a draft submission for the councillor's consideration for the submission of the two subsequent bills before the select committee. The Water Services Legislation Bill provides the necessary detail to establish the functions, powers, duties of the Water Services entities. The Water Services Economic Efficiency and Consumer Protection Bill sets up the economic regulator and provides a range of compliance and enforcement tools. This complements the role of the Water Quality Regulator. Once councils have considered the merits and content of on a submission on the two bills, the final iteration of a submission is required by the Select Committee no later than the 17th of February. Thank you, Chris. Uh, questions? No, it seems that was super clear. Thank you, Chris. So now I'm going to invite Councillor Brown to introduce the paper. Um, Chris, I think you might want to stay just because there are some amendments that we'll probably need your feedback on. So yeah, get you to stay there. Uh, Councillor Brown, I'll invite you to move the paper and um, and choose a seconder as well for that. Right, thank you. Um, so obviously this legislation is extremely important. We've had two pieces of law passed already. One is going to define the qualitative uh, uh, regulation of water in the three waters of New Zealand. Uh, no doubt there's an enterprise being established as we speak to um, to do that. Hopefully it's not in Auckland because they won't be able to get to work because of the failure of the stormwater system up there. Um, the, and also the other part is the establishment of the, the new Crown enterprise that will take over the three water functions in New Zealand. These two pieces of legislation, one is deals with the transfer of the Wellington City Council's assets, liabilities and responsibilities to the new enterprise. That's the water services legislation. And then the second part is with the establishment of a regulator who will do the economic and efficiency regulation. So we'll have the quality regulator that's already been established and now we're going to get the, the, an economic and efficiency regulator. Uh, what the what the officers have recommended, which I uh, agree with, is in respect of the first part of the, these pieces of legislation and our submission, is that we want to make sure that the assets and liabilities and functions that we're transferring to the new enterprise is done in a way that's fair and reasonable to Wellington residents. So we have a problem in the city because, as you're probably aware, we have a very large value of assets but actually a very small value of liabilities specifically tagged to those assets. So we could end up transferring an enormous um, chunk of value uh, without losing m much of our debt. And yet other, other cities, for instance, Christchurch, as I understand it, has got something like $2 billion worth of liabilities that it will be transferring into um, this vehicle because it's got a large amount of debt which is tagged against its water assets or its three water assets. Uh, Watercare has something like $4 billion worth of liabilities that it will be transferring. And so you can see that it's how you've actually done the accounting in the past is going to create a cost or a benefit to a, to a city. So what we're submitting on is that the, that the, um, the value of our liabilities needs to be uh, assessed fairly. And, and uh, I think that's a very sensible thing for us to be telling the select committee. The other is that uh, the current arrangement, as I understand it, enables the billing or the relationship between the new water services enterprise and the customers to effectively be run as it is at the moment, as you're all aware from all those emails, we constantly keep on receiving. Uh, if somebody has a complaint about the water in Wellington, they come to the city council, we sort of pass on the remediation to the uh, Wellington Water Limited, uh, and we of course do all the billing, care of the rates. now. It's critically important that those responsibilities, that customer relationship is transferred to the new enterprise as quickly as possible. So we don't have any ability to influence this. It's not going to be our responsibility, but we are going to be seen by the public as fronting it. So we don't want that. We want the, uh, the responsibilities to be assumed by the new enterprise ASAP. Both of those things make a lot of sense to me, and I think we should support what ma management are recommending. On the economic regulator, I have a number of, dis of disagreements, if you like, what is being uh, proposed by council of officers, and I'd just like to explain. I've had a lot of experience with economic regulation. We have three different regimes in New Zealand. One is around energy distribution, one is around airports, and one is around telecommunications. And 
specifically what is going to occur here is that the, the legislation is going to empower the Commerce Commission to create a regulatory environment for uh, the water, the three waters, basically. And the Commerce Commission will go away and it will prepare a, a, a regulatory framework. It's probably going to be about 500 pages. It will take them two to three years to do that. And at the end of that, there will be an extensive process of consultation, and then they'll promulgate the final regulations, and those are the ones which will actually pertain. I think that Wellington City Council needs to engage very thoroughly with that regulatory process once the Commerce Commission kicks it off. Uh, and I think we need to have external expertise. I mean, at Wellington Airport, we, we engaged there with the, the same process and we spent something like $2 million on external advice because even though the airport has got plenty of expertise, this is a very specialist area and I wouldn't want us to be relying on our own staff. I think we need externals. I think we need high quality externals and we don't want to stint on what we spend because the outcome of the regulatory uh, regime will be very important for our residents. But I don't think we should pay for it. So I think we should have a submission to the uh, select committee that the, the, the Crown makes funding available to councils to, to enable us to fully engage and to actually employ external advice. I don't agree with management's uh, feedback on that point that it's impractical. I think this is something which really matters for us and I don't think we should be paying for it. Uh, the other point which I also would like us to specify in our submission to the Select Committee is that we want the legislation to specify certain overarching principles because at the moment otherwise the Commerce Commission has effectively got a carte blanche to actually regulate as it see fit. So I think we want to actually specify certain principles that we think are going to be good for Wellington residents, the people we represent, uh, in the ultimate sort of drafting process which the Commerce Commission undertakes. And the critical one there is that there shouldn't be cross subsidisation. So that Wellington residents should, should only be paying for the services which they are actually consuming. We should not be paying for uh, the upgrade to the facilities and the provision of services to people outside of Wellington. And I think that's an extremely important uh, requirement. It's, it's very vague at the moment as to exactly what is intended, and I think we want to be explicit on that point, that Wellington residents should only pay for the services which they're actually getting. Within Wellington, I think there's another point, and that is that there, there should be charging, the, the basis of the charging which the Commerce Commission will be regulating should be based on the, the concept of efficient provision of service, so that again, there isn't a sort of a one-size-fits-all. Uh, as you know, with our sludge minimization uh, pricing levy that we've you know, sort of agreed, uh, we are also sort of going that way in terms of sludge minimization. We want that sort of charging, and I think we should actually be effectively submitting for something similar across the board for uh, water pricing and the three water pricing. And then the final point, which I think we should also specify, is that ultimately, and we had the gentleman this morning talking about water pricing and his dismay with the you know, so-called neoliberalism, I, I think there will be some uh, shocks to, to people when they see their water charges, because obviously there'll be winners and losers. Uh, out of this and there needs to be a period where there is the ability for appropriate social agencies to be able to you know, be aware of what the problem is going to be and, and then to actually come up with solutions. It's not going to be the water enterprises who are going to be running the sort of social welfare service. At the moment, if you can't pay your power bill, there are facilities you can go to through um, social agencies to actually get them to uh, you know, subsidise your energy. I think there's going to be something which will have to actually be uh, developed by social agencies agencies in New Zealand, and I think our submissions should actually specify that the water pricing regime that the Commerce Commission ultimately specifies for the WEC allows uh, the, effectively the social agencies enough time to actually come up with an appropriate regime to enable that sort of help for people who are vulnerable and, and effectively are going to be incurring greater charges. So that's the basis of the recommended amendments that I've actually put forward. Thank you, Councillor. So Everyone's clear. What we're going to do now is uh, we are going to have Councillor Brown's amendments on the screen, and now is an opportunity to ask questions of uh, Chris and the team about those amendments. Questions only, and if they make a point, there's no opportunity to respond to them. We're not debating with them. They're providing us with their free and frank advice. Okay, so I'm going to start, but everyone put your hand up um, if you want to ask a question. Could you be super clear with us about which, uh, can we go through the list and can you just yes or no, which you do and don't support? 
so we're super clear because I, yeah, I want to understand which of these are in the intent of the original submission and which go against the intent. The attachment. So these are different to what I have in front of me. That's it. Yeah, yeah. We, we probably need some time because what we've done is we've taken these and we've turned them into um, probably clearer amendments and that's what we've been working off and that's what was emailed out last night. Mm. Our advice was based on those tidied up amendments. Um, Yep, we'll adjourn so that officers can have a look over those and come back to us, but please stay at the table unless you really, really need.
advice. Okay, everyone, so you might want to get your pen and paper ready, perhaps, because the officers are going to go through um, the amendments and let us know which ones they do and don't support. And why, briefly. If you want to dig into some of those answers, just put your hand up and I'll put you on the question list. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the time. We'll go through each one, and there's only one there that officers are strongly opposed to. The rest of them we could support, um, but there is a level of practicality with putting some of the, um, the amendments into in legislation, some of the amendments, and there's also a level of practicality that we don't have all the information required at this point in time to meaningfully um, give strong advice either way at the moment, which is what that's, that's been reflected in the officer's advice. So that, um, just moving through on the, on the first one, um, so I was going to get my, my notes. Um, We do support this. Our advice, though, yeah. Number B, support this. Number C, we do not support this. C, not, not supported. Not supported. D? D and E are both supported. Yeah. So to be clear, officers of these amendments, officers are not supporting C? Correct. 3C? Correct. Why? Councillor Matthew, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and why not? It's, it's, it's not I, I think the answer to that was that because it's about cross subsidisation and cross subsidisation is actually a real integral part of the reforms. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sweet. Uh, Councillor Randall, Councillor Randall, did you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That ex exactly oh, yes. right. It's a yeah. He, he, he confirms that. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Councillor Free. Well, I guess for me, I'm interested to know how we've progressed on our argument to the government that we had very little debt because when we did some of our water infrastructure, namely the Mobile Treatment Plant, we sold capital power. Um, well, it wasn't us, it was previous council, sold capital power to be responsible to, I suppose, in a way to avoid extra debt for ratepayers. And now it looks like we're going to be in a position where we don't have the asset that we got for that exchange, nor do we have capital power. And um, and I know there was approaches made to government to try and understand how we'd be um, treated over this matter. And I'm really quite, actually quite um, uh, anxious that we um, know more, um, yeah, quite soon. Um, I am really concerned, actually, about what's happening in this space. And I will probably be supporting this your answer on the capital power and how we'll be treated. Um, so through you, Chair. Um, that process is all still underway. Uh, the negotiation is due to take place uh, next month and uh, rest assured officers are working very hard to make sure that we get a very good outcome for the city on those negotiations. At this point in time, we don't have enough information to to provide su to sufficient update for the purposes of the submission but we are working very hard on, on making sure we get a good outcome there. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Randall. And these are questions on these amendments, by the way. It yep. was relevant to that amendment. It was. And I'm just reminding you. Um, yes, I, I understand that you don't support it because of the principle of cross subsidisation. Yeah, I am. I understand your, you know, because because that's actually a principle of the bill. Do you have the information to know the level of financial cross subsidisation that will occur in terms of um, the other council's debt that will be taken on by the new entity um, or not? So, no. so you have no idea how much. So it's sort of like a blank check that we are signing up to. Um, this. 
like I said, those negotiations will all take place beginning um, later this month with councils across the country. They are having bilateral uh, negotiations with, with each and every council. Uh, and then the debt configuration of what goes into these new entities will be um, sort of for the Treasury, central government and these new entities to, um, to work out and consolidate effectively. We, as they're being performed on a bilateral basis, we don't have the information to be able to consolidate that ourselves. Uh, that's um, all been done. So, so, so not only do you not know now, but you will never know? We'll be able to investigate the balance sheets of these entities once they're stood up, um, and I've got... But, but afterwards, we'll find out how much we're cross-subsidising. Mm. OK, thanks. Poiwi, uh, Liz. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for the explanation. I get it, um, that, and I do understand that that is a big part of of um, the principles of, of what they're, they're trying to do. But for the purposes of this council and for today, can you confirm that um, if this, this could still go through, I mean, you're saying you don't support it because it goes against that, but... Would you have a problem with us supporting it in as much as I feel that a lot of the things in here, I, I believe that they're really good, um, but they don't necessarily mean that we're going to get it. But what it does do is it sends a signal that this is what we're saying. And so that's why I personally don't have, I hear what you're saying, but I don't have a problem with us putting that in because I think um, that there's some really good points there that a council that has been really prudent, kept their debt down, is now going to be penalised for that and or, or is there going to be a way, I'm sure there is, a way that we're going to be reimbursed for that. But I think it's just keeping... Um, and in the forefront that, that, you know, there's concerns with this council that this could happen. So what I'm asking you is, well, I understand what you've said, um, there's not a real problem for us to agree to all of this, so is there? That's just their advice, just their advice. Yep, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it's not going to be outrageous. Oh, I mean, we can. We can. Yeah. Yep, that's up to us. Yeah, yep, cool. Totally, totally. Yep. Uh, Councillor Winetta. Thank you for that. Could I please ask officers to clarify their support of 3B? Can you just call on the please? We're just moving it on the screen. Or explain it, rather. We are, we are. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, through you, Chair. Uh, so the reason we didn't explicitly uh, uh, support this initially when the amendment was brought to our attention is because there are avenues for effectively anyone to request request a high court judicial review of effectively any actions taken by a government department. Uh, but legis putting it into the legislation isn't necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. You can do it either way. So that was mainly why we advised against because it's still possible without having to legislate it in this specific bill. Cool. I think that takes us to the end of questions. So now it's time for debate. So, Councillor Brown, did you have a preferred seconder for your paper? Maybe the mayor? I'd if, like me to second if, the if, Yep, cool. And you can speak now or you can reserve your right. Reserve, reserve your right, nice. Uh, so, yep, so we've got Matthews. Who else would like to? Uh, McNulty. Cool. You get to speak at the end, Councillor Brown. You get to reply to everybody, but you don't have to, but you can. Okay, cool. All right, so we'll kick off with uh, Councillor Matthews. Um, I'd like to thank Councillor Brown for his work on these amendments. Um, uh, and the timely way and the kind of the process you've uh, followed this week, I really appreciate it. Um, uh, but I, I definitely will not be supporting C. Um, and I guess I just want to emphasise the position that Wellington City Council goes into these water reforms in, which is not good. And that any cross subsidisation is, regardless of the debt position, is likely to favour Wellingtonians um, because the state of our water is the worst in the country and it is in the most need of the greatest investment. And um, I, I, I just, I guess I don't want to um, 
do anything that's going to jeopardise our position as a council um, to go in and actually get these uh, problems, which are very real and everybody sees on a daily basis, fixed for Wellingtonians. So therefore, I will be voting against um, C. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McNulty. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Rebecca pretty much verbatim <laughs> summed it up. Very little to add. It's just that, yeah, I do appreciate Tim's promptness in bringing these amendments and actually giving us time to give mm. them true consideration. Yep. Um, it's an example to the rest of us, to be fair, as councillors, of how we should legislate from the table. Um, on C, it is that cross principle of cross-subsidisation. We will probably be the beneficiaries of that, and at times in the future, other parts in our region may need it more, but we actually are all just New Zealanders. We all live in the Wellington area. If we have to help out people in the hut, that's okay. I go to the hut, I use their facilities, people from the hut come in here. We don't need to be explicitly tribal about this, and I do think that, as Rebecca has pointed out, we will be the main beneficiaries, at least in the initial life of Entity C, for any cross-subsidisation. But Happy with the other amendments as proposed. Thank you. Councillor Free. Well, my, my position is that we have ex collectively expressed some degree of concern over some of these reforms, and I do not see that there's any harm in, in um, myself in expressing some reservations about the degree of cross subsidisation. If it is, in fact, that poorer um, parts of the country have to subsidise Wellington, maybe that's something that, that should be looked at as well. So I think that um, I'm certainly, um, I do have a degree of concern about the whole approach here and I will be supporting these amendments. Councillor Chung. Thanks. Um, just um, thank you, uh, Councillor Matthews and, um, and McNulty. I would like to ask um, if this is actually correct that any cross subsidy will benefit Welling well sorry will work against Wellington because I'm not sure that our our infrastructure is actually worse than anyone else. So uh, I would like okay. to ask Mr. Councillor, Councillor Brown there. Unfortunately, we've already entered into debate and we can't ask questions of officers once we've entered it because then we could just do that all day. So um, you've kind of just got to listen to your colleagues' arguments and make a judgment based on those arguments. There is a Q and A document on Diligent that might have some more information about that cross subsidisation part. Um, but officers can't wait in now that we've entered into debate, unfortunately. Okay. Can I just make one final comment? Yep, you can debate. Okay, yep. okay. Um, okay. I, I trust uh, Councillor Brown's um, expertise on this and I will follow his advice and I will be voting for this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Randall, and put your hands up. Uh, you can put your hand up at any time, by the way, and you get put on a list to speak, so don't wait until the last moment. Yes, I'm, I'm listening carefully to um, both sides, and and I do understand that Wellington fixing Wellington waters, irrespective of whether we vote for or against uh, item C, is the priority. Um, I, I, I guess the con you know the concern I have, and I sort of fleshed out in my question, is that we really have no idea what the level of cross subsidy will be, or the level of investment, of what this entity C will provide, and so. Um, I am, you know, I, I am pretty sure though. What, you know, given that rates are uh, generally rated, water rates are rated like everything. You know, are, are, are we're going to get a, a fairly um, Wellington residents are likely to end up paying for the infrastructure that we need to be fixed, and we really have uh, little control over what Entity C does in terms of how it funds the infrastructure investment that it's going to do with different parts of the region. They, they, there's, they, they could well decide to target Wellington uh, ratepayers to fund the investment needed for Wellington uh, water, and so we'll end up picking up the bill anyway. Uh, into the point C is really about um, making sure that the message goes to recognise that when we do hand over our assets, broken that they are, that we're handing them over not with an attendant amount of debt uh, and, and so I, I think that's why I'll be uh, supporting uh, item C, because I think it's about sending the right message to support the negotiation processes to happen further around to make it clear that what this council uh, recognises that while we haven't spent the money on fixing our water infrastructure, one of the reasons we haven't spent it is uh, simply because we haven't had the resource, not because we weren't going to 
willing to willing to fund it through additional debt. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, Poiwi Liz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd I also would like to uh, thank Councillor Brown, and particularly for his explanation. Um, I think that it was really helpful in making the decisions, and I, um, I uh, am going to support um, the recommendations. And based on what I said before, is that uh, you know we're putting these all in there, but n there's no way of us knowing that any of them are going to be um, taken any notice of. Um, I also, <laughs> but that's true, that's, yeah, that, that's true. But what we're doing though is that we're giving a clear signal that these are the things that concern us as, as a council. Uh, um, and I just wanna say that while I'm supporting um, C, I, I support these reforms and why we need to do it. Um, because as a country, we need to look at, at our infrastructure as, as a country. And we know that um, that some of our, our smaller councils just don't have the boot here to put in the infrastructure. So it makes sense to me um, what we're looking at doing, that, that the ones that have got the boot here are going to be um, supporting them because as a whole, it's going to benefit our country. Um, so I, I support that and I don't believe that, that um, C goes in any way against um, against that big goal. I believe what C is saying, it's like um, an extra check for whatever um, the select committee comes up with. There's another another level of transparency about where they land and, and who's paying for what and wh where it's going. And I really don't see um, any harm in and in, um, in this, and I just want to thank the work that the officers have done as well, and and guiding um, Councillor Brown. And I, I yeah, I, I think it's great, and I'm going to support it. And Poiwi Holden. Kia ora, Chair. Um, just on the uh, recommendation C, the amendment C. I mean, I've listened really carefully to what um, Poiwi. Um, Kelly has, has talked about, and to the advice we've received today, I too support the, um, the reforms, but my concern with supporting Amendment C is if it goes to the fundamental premise or one of the fundamental premises of the reforms, you might be implicitly saying you don't support the reforms, so that, that's not what I'm gonna support, so I'll be supporting all the amendments except C. All right, um, right of reply, Councillor Brown, and let's put that timer on, please. Thank you. Uh, actually, I, di I just wanted to, uh, I forgot in my preamble to just mention one of the um, amendments, which is the one about the High Court. And the reason why, and I know that management are okay on that, and I know that everyone around the table seems to be okay, but. I, I was participated in the, uh, when the Commerce Commission defined the airport regulations, and there was actually the select committee who'd, who, who had created part four of the um, Commerce Act, and, and they, they specified that there was going to be a high court review, and it did actually change the approach that the Commerce Commission took, because the commission knew that, there, that the high court was going to be reviewing it at the end. And so it, it stylistically meant it was a difference, I think, because the commission was then obliged to be very, more mindful of the fact that actually the court, somebody else was going to be running a ruler over what they did. So it's quite different to a situation where the commission will come up with its uh, regulatory regime and then people who have got a, you know, like a really strong gripe come up and take it to the high court. So it, it's, it's, I think it's much more constructive for us to actually have it in there from day one, basically. Um, to talk specifically about the cross subsidization, the regional cross subsidization port that I guess is the one that is more contentious around the table. First, I, I th you know, I think Re Rebecca or Councillor Matthews is, is incorrect in being concerned that this would actually cause a delay to the improvement to Wellington's water. I think that the qualitative regulator is going to require the minimum standards and so that the, the rules are going to be set by the quality regulator, who, as you all know, has already been established. 
So the, the, the who pays issue is quite separate to what's going to be done. I don't think there's any reason to believe that an allocation of charges um, to, the, to the users is, is going to change the fact of what actually is actually done. Uh, as to the, go to the heart of the, the regime, Holden's point, I, I really would disagree with that. I don't think it does. I think management uh, or officers are, are incorrect on that point. I have read enough about the legislation to understand that there are sort of uh, this, this sort of regional and user pays type approach is sort of generally, as I understand it, is kind of in this stuff and there isn't this, you know, encapsulation. So I don't see this as an any way. I'm, I'm in support of the overall thrust of the regulatory regime. I think that whether we have a change of government or not this year, we are going to have a qualitative uh, regulator. We are going to have an economic regulator. The only question that we will be looking for an answer from October is whether the it's going to be the sort of this massive entity or whether there's going to be some other sort of, you know, Wellington Watercare Limited type entity come out of this. So I, I don't think that in any way supporting C uh, would in any way be seen to be a criticism of the overarching principles of the regime. Um, and I really endorse Liz's comments that we don't know what the select committee will listen to. I mean, the probability from past experience of going to select committees, where I don't think anything I've ever said to them has ever been listened to. So, <laughs> um, so I'm, you know, I've got, I'm, bat I'm, bat I'm batting like a, a zero out of uh, New Zealand cricket team playing with the Indians like last night. And so, uh, but I think we, I think we want to state principles that are really important to us. And I think the principle that the, the people of Wellington should only pay for what they're getting out of this regime is quite an important principle. So that's why I think that we should support C. All right, thank you, Councillor. So we are going to vote first on one and two. So uh, one is receiving the information. Two is noting the bills and when they become law. I've got my amendment. Yeah. Sorry. So before I thought we were just voting on the amendments. Which was sent last night? We were debating just now. Oh, so but why are you doing one and two before we've finished all the amendments? Or because we've at, because we're voting because everyone was just debating. This was moved pro forma, so everyone was debating the paper as well as this uh, the amendments by Councillor Brown. Okay, but then you'll put my amendment and uh, we'll have no because we're voting now. No, no, I put an amendment. It's an I amended substantive. Every, we've just had Councilor one, Paul, two, three, I put, sorry, I put, can I finish speaking? We've just had more than eight people speaking and you didn't put no, your hand no, up to put... No, no, Councillor Paul, I thought we were dealing with these amendments. I put an amendment through last night, in fact, in yesterday afternoon, and I'd just like that to be considered. It's, it was, we are voting now. No, no, Councillor Paul, actually, that is not following standing orders. You can't do that. So I don't know why there is such... No, 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 this this is the thing. We've just been debating for a long time. We've that had heaps of people. That is irrelevant. I asked for... I'm going to make the call process. that it's too late. I didn't receive your email last night. Well, it was. It was sent through to all councillors. I'm sorry, but that's my ruling. I will be asking for advice from... In fact, actually... Yeah, actually, Ms McKerra, I'm really sorry. I... I, I <laughs> Uh, can I please ask for some advice about whether the chair can actually exercise that power? When I did send the amendment through yesterday, and all councillors should have got it. It's not I don't think it's been that clear, actually. I thought we were just voting on um, these, Tim's these particular, amendments. particular changes. Tim's I think it was, okay. When Tim introduced the paper, he spoke to the substance of the entire reforms and the submission that we're making. We had officers' questions on the entire paper, and then we had a separate session with questions on the amendments as part of the amended substantive. I think that it was no, no, totally it, clear that it was, was an amended was, substantive. Was if the council has a point of order, they should make yeah, it. Yeah, Otherwise, just, we will move to the I, vote. Could I just ask for advice from the chief executive about process? Thank you. We have the standing orders being consulted Through as well. Through you, Chair, I'm, I'm just asking uh, Democratic Services advisors Thank to you. check the standing orders and give you clear administrative advice. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's not very good the way that this is able to go. We can adjourn. <laughs>
request to add an amendment, but I am going to be ruling that out because uh, there's a standing order that says that you can't move an amendment or debate after the right of reply has been had. There were two separate uh, two separate instances where we were able to ask questions which I think made it clear that this was an amended substantive and sending an email the night before does not make you uh, any more able to interrupt the standing orders or to um, go against them. So my ruling is that we won't be accepting an amendment. Just let me finish, please. Uh, and that's my ruling. So, so just a point of order. Um, as a councillor, I... I've, What's your I've, point of order? My point of order is that uh, as my understanding, we were only debating the amendments that Councillor Brown put forward and not the substantive. That's not a point of and order. You need to find what your point of order is. Okay. All right. So we're going to vote now, and we will be voting on receiving the information and on number two, which is noting uh, the first of the related bill. Uh, you can see that wording on your screen. So please sorry, vote. Using sorry, your could remote. we take one and two separately? Sure. Thank so you. we'll take one first, which is receiving the information. Uh, Councillor Young. <laughs> you are not. You are not. <laughs> All right, so that's carried. And then we'll go to number two. So that is noting the first of the three related bills. The Water Services Entities has already passed on the floor. That's carried unanimously. And now we're going to go through each of these uh, 3A to 3E individually. Three, uh, separately. So Sorry, will three be done separately? Uh, yeah. Three first and then 3A, 3B, 3C, 3G. Yeah, we're taking it all separately. Okay, thank yeah. you. Just making sure. So we'll start with three. And that's carried. Next, we're going to go to 3A. Carried unanimously. And 3B. Okay, and then we've got 3C. Uh, so that is lost. Oh, so no. <laughs> I really didn't. Sorry, I've just been a bit distracted in the last five minutes. So that's 10 against and 7-4. And we'll go to 3D. And that's carried unanimously and 3E. Cool. 
that's carried unanimously, and then four, which is um, delegation for the to finalise the submission. Okay, and that is carried, thank you. <laughs> so now we're gonna move on to the submission on the bills relating to resource management reform. I'm gonna welcome Sean Ordain up to the table to give us a brief introduction to the submission. The government has proposed much needed reform to the Resource Management Act, the primary planning and environmental statute for New Zealand. As the capital city, it is of the highest strategic importance that Wellington is provided with the tools to ensure we are equipped for the future well-being of our people, the ecological security of our environment, and with a pathway through this time of climate change impact. Before the committee is a submission supporting the passage of two of the three replacement acts, the Natural and Built Environment Bill and the Strategic Planning Bill, and, the, and urging the progress of the third, the Climate Change Adaptation Bill. The reforms are voluminous and complex. <laughs> However, whilst not a transformation of the way that planning and environmental management will be carried out in New Zealand, they do represent an important iteration that will deliver greater certainty from the planning system for New Zealand. In the spirit of this iteration, the submission before you lays out some practical considerations, particularly in terms of proportional representation on regional planning committees, uh, and other local democracy concerns that we recommend the committee considers to ensure the new system is not bedeviled by the delays and uncertainties of the system it is replacing. RMA reform is complex and it has placed considerable uh, stress upon many members of the community trying to fulfil the short time frames granted uh, by the select committee. I have sent officers to Ngāti Toa Rangatira uh, last night and received advice of their submission content. I would note that the submission of our mana whenua partners is more detailed than what we have laid out and lays out a series of concerns with the proposed laws. In recognition of these concerns, I would request the committee allow the amendment of the submission to refer the select committee directly to the submissions of our mana whenua partners in respect of Māori participation within the resource management system. It is important to recognise that in raising these issues, we are firm in our support for the replacement of the present complex, litigious and management heavy system with something that moves us to a more strategic and capable future for New Zealand. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And do we have any questions on this? So this is questions for the submission as prepared by officers. Councillor Pannett. Um, first of all, thank you for taking one for the team and actually reading the 800 pages in the, the bill. Okay. Um, it certainly wasn't um, simple. I guess I just want to challenge you or to understand why you've come to this view that change is needed when really it just comes across as an attempt to centralise power. But what's it actually really doing for the environment except for basically maybe setting some environmental limits? So, in the, in the decade and a bit that I've been a city planner in New Zealand and through teaching the subject, one of the things I have observed is that the resource management system in New Zealand provides very little certainty for almost any participant. One of the key things that unites planning systems around the world is that certainty. The other area that the RMA falls considerably short of is it operates a market-based mechanism which requires the trading and quantification of effects. How you quantify intangible effects uh, is extremely problematic and essentially means that you cannot operate a market and therefore the Act does not operate effectively and does not deliver on the outcomes. All we have to do is look at the cost of housing, the lack of provision for the environment, 
and the impact that this uncertainty is having on our city and cities across New Zealand to understand that the current situation is unsustainable. I'll take that to debate. Um, the designations, um, we've had some discussion about that, highly complex. Um, would it be your view that uh, ministerial powers have been increased in terms of managing conflicts through the, uh, the national planning framework? So when, for example, we have a motorway or a run, uh, airport extension, uh, economic interests can be given on the basis of one person priority over the environment? The powers of requiring ministers have been increased by the proposed bills. Uh, the designation system is one of the few parts of the original Town and Country Planning Act, New Zealand's original statutes, that remains entire. And what those designations do is effectively remove uh, the, the consenting systems for large nationally important infrastructure or line infrastructure from local bodies' hands and from democratic accountability. There is difficulty in operating national, on a national scale in a local effects environment. Whether that balance is correct is more a call f for you as elected representatives. From a technical point of view, this law would operate, but it, would, it may not give the amount of community participation that you envisage. And last question, um, you talk about the need for uh, the balancing of objectives. The past history has been that where we have balanced the, we have had a lot of environmentally damaging projects. How do you see that this bill will stop that happening? So one of the many flaws of the previous Resource Management Act was you, it was very difficult for planners to take into account climate change. This bill does allow for climate, the Climate Change Adaptation Act to enter the planning system directly. It also binds us to emissions reduction plans, which is an important innovation. It is important to understand that the planning acts are essentially constitutional pieces of legislation. They create the system and framework through which objectives are presented and applied into the environment. The actual application of those objectives is dependent upon the politics and the governance of the day. Any other questions? Great, okay, so I'm gonna be really clear about this process that we're gonna do now. So, Sean has just introduced the paper. We've had an opportunity to ask Sean questions about the submission in the original paper. I'm gonna move the paper, and it's an amended substantive, so that means that there are some amendments to the substantive that you originally saw that I'm moving with the paper. You will then have an opportunity to ask questions about those amendments, and then we will get into debate. Debate is your opportunity to put amendments forward, so you put your name on the list and that's your opportunity to move your amendments, then we move to debate of those amendments, then we vote on the amendments, and then we return back to the paper. So if you have amendments, you need to do them in the debate of the paper. Is that crystal clear? What, what happens, you're able to ask officers advice on these amendments, which have been moved with the paper pro forma, but what happens about subsequent amendments? Do you then have a You will have an opportunity to ask questions about those. Okay. Yeah, and my understanding is there's only one set of amendments aside from these ones that are coming with the paper. Okay, so I wanna just make that crystal clear. So, I'm gonna move this paper now seeing as there's no more questions. So I want to begin by acknowledging Sean for your mahi on this um, submission. Thank you for um, the phone calls, the emails, and, and um, all the corridor keeping me up to date with this process and what's going on, because I know there was a really tight turnaround um, with this uh, opening up for submissions right before Christmas and that you and your team had to work through your um, holidays um, at some point. So thank you for that. And yeah, it's a massive piece of work and you had to read through 800 pages and you've been really comprehensive, but still manage to stay focused on the core parts that we want to influence and I think we can be tempted to get down into the details when really it's about sticking to that high level. Um, so thanks for that. Part of me feels really sad about the reforms actually because I just got a, a, a planning degree and it's almost totally useless now because I know about the RMA which is about to be reformed but um, <laughs> thankfully we've got Sean here who can kind of Keep me up to date with um, these changes as they happen, so that's great, and I think we can all agree that the resource management system needs to be reformed, and that's what we're getting. So 
I move it. Sean's been super clear about what's in the bill. So now I'm going to ask for a seconder. So, Councillor Matthews, um, would you like to speak now? Or would you like to reserve? I'll reserve right? my right to speak. Awesome. So we've got that. And now I'm going to ask for speakers. And I know Councillor Panett has some amendments on this. So I'll invite you to introduce those. Thank you very much, Tia. Um, so, again, my thanks to officers too and Mr Ordain, thank you. You've been really helpful because this, what I'm trying to deal with is highly, highly complex and so you've really helped me understand some things. Um, and you did uh, ruin your summer holidays over this. Um, so that's much appreciated. Um, I do want to start with possibly referring to an unfair comment by a commentator. Josie Bacani, a couple of two weeks ago, she said after the Prime Minister resigned, what was the point of all that? Now, that might be a bit harsh, but she was calling as a member of the left to say, this government promised transformational change and then didn't. Did some iterative change, which, you know, is always gratefully accepted, but nevertheless didn't do transformational change. And I guess I, when it comes to this legislation, uh, many good people have worked on it, I'm sure, with good intentions, but I sort of say, what is the point? Because essentially, it's taking a lot of what was already bad and putting it into another bit of legislation which will take 10 years to implement, and it's not really going to fix the problem. We declared a, a climate and ecological emergency in 2019, and that has been the framework of which we have um, managed a number of our work streams since then. And I'm not a very emotional person uh, always, but you know I almost feel like crying at the fact that this, at this time of absolute crisis, we have such a poor process and such a poor piece of legislation uh, to, um, to guide our efforts. So I, I really don't want to talk for too long, but I do think this is such a massive piece of work that um, I think it does require a little bit of conversation, but I'll be succinct. First of all, this uh, bill can, uh, can goes on with the Labor government's centralisation effect, effort of taking power of local government, of communities, and putting it into the central government. More acronyms, sorry, Councillor Young, more stuff to learn, more complexity, less local control, and more gatekeepers, because, of course, the planners and the RMA lawyers are then, you know, like, can help us explain what really we should all be able to understand. I have never been able to understand the political strategy between centralisation from my friends and colleagues on the left. While it might be good if you've got a green transport minister wanting to put the light rail through with these powers, it is not so good if you've got a national party member Mia Fano has publicly raised concerns about the national member who might be the next Minister of Transport. And if that person has those powers, what we're going to get is motorways, or we're going to get prisons, or we're going to get more um, airport expansions. The designations, of course, some, well, sometimes having that control is a good thing for public goods, but there are some things which are highly environmentally problematic. And I absolutely reject the idea that ministers, one minister, should be able to have so much control over our environment. I consider that this legislation lacks urgency, given we've got uh, an, um, an emergency and there are not enough safeguards for the environment. We don't need to talk about balance. Nature does an excellent job of, it its, uh, of its itself, and we should follow that. Community democracies, I'm sure you know, is removed from the system outcomes of Section 5, which is outrageous. The, the whole point of the RMA was to enable that community participation. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I you know, came into the environmental movement through challenging this, the power of the state and of this council who made a bad call and we needed to be able to challenge that process through the court. We didn't succeed in that, in that phase, but we did the next time. Again, we have rights of appeal limited and no accountability for very, very powerful ministers. The designations for me are of huge concern. While they may allow for good things, they also allow for bad things, and the ministerial powers given uh, to the uh, Minister for the Environment through the National Planning Framework is going to result in bad decisions made by people who do not have the environment at their heart. The fact that we've got three bits of legislation which aren't all being introduced at the same time and therefore we, if we struggle to understand how they work together is really difficult. I've also raised concerns about stormwater, which is why there's an amendment in there about how the intersection works between the proposed three water entities and um, this particular regime, it's going to be really tricky. The limits, I thought, was one positive thing I could say about the bill, but I was being reminded that they've been a bit flex on freshwater. You know, you can sort of change them around to suit your economic agenda. So unless they're set hard in stone, then are of not uh, much good. 
Certainty, I, I listened with interest to the officer. I don't want certainty, I want good environmental outcomes and protection for our environment so future generations can continue to live in this wonderful world. Uh, certainty is helpful, but it's not the main goal. So, um, I really want to thank officers, just before I get into the amendments, I think you've really picked up some good process questions around the resourcing of councils, and, and that's, that's gonna be a really big issue. The sub plans, obviously I would support and you know, taking climate change into account, at least that's a bit of a bit of progress. Right, so just to end, on the amendments. Um, so this is where, I'm sorry, I was talking to a lawyer at 10.30 last night. It's been a very tight turnaround. Um, the designations are, as I've said, are problematic. So what the um, officer just gave me some advice about how I could say this through both pieces of legislation, that we need to look at full public consultation, which is not required at the moment, environmental impact studies when they um, are proposed, and consideration of alternatives. I appreciate under the current legislation, alternatives must be considered, but we want a more rigorous standard there. Um, then, um, look, I've really struggled with this one. The, the criticism of the current RMA is right about its complexity, but you'd also could say that the current regime, or the proposed regime, is also complex. So I just, I really just struggled and said, look, maybe they just, they just need to be some key stakeholders who come and run a rollover and just see if there can be some simplicity introduced, because it's just really, really hard. Um, I put in something about the resource management and water reforms, um, the stormwater and, and just how, and maybe asking the government politely just to look at how those conflicts might be managed between having different regimes, different decision-making entities. Um, for me, C is the, uh, the heart of the issue f uh, and of my concern. Rather than, um, so that we put in something that we say this is an urgent situation, we do need to take into account climate change and our damage to life critical ecosystems um, we need to put that in there. And also that we, as we uh, did with the three waters, we put the environment before human health because when we do that, we can look after all of humanity. So the, the clause three is the heart of the bill and it should be about protecting the environment. And then the sub clauses allow for meeting the needs of human humanity, which of course are critical. Um, and sorry, I just need to, D is now no longer needed because I've put the designations in there. Oh no, actually, sorry. D, I've just put a bit more uh, commentary around that. Um, sustainability principles and accountability where decision makers are not making the best decisions um, in light of the environment. And finally, community participation, uh, which I'm passionate about is a long standing environmental principle um, that community participation should be added to section five, which is the system outcomes and environmental legal aid should be increased where we've got large scale projects and um, there is a large amount of uh, public interest. I can tell you taking on the government or a large private entity is very difficult when you've got $30,000 in the bank, which you literally have to run, raise through cake sales and dance parties. It's very difficult, so that really needs to be fixed. So I think that's enough from me now. Happy to answer any questions later on um, after hearing officers' response. Yeah, can we get advice from officers? That, 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 that is next in the process. Uh, but do you need some time to look at these, or are you happy to give advice now? Because you can have some time to have a look at these if you'd like. I'm happy to give advice now. Cool. Okay, I'll start it off. Um, we'd, we're interested to know which ones you do and don't support in the same kind of uh, just, you know, go down the list and just let us know. So our assistance has been purely in terms of drafting. Yep. Uh, no approval or disapproval has been expressed from officers. In respect of two, uh, we remain neutral, largely because all parts of the bills are subject to Section 3, which is the purposes and principles of the Act, uh, which is standard statutes interpretation. Uh, and so that is more a question of emphasis, uh, which is a question for the Council rather than for officers. For four, the we have no objection to uh, to this. For D, we would note that the relationship between 
uh, resource management and water reforms is very complex and it's still being understood. Uh, there are significant questions about how that will work in practice uh, and a lot of those questions stem from the form that regulation will take underneath the bills so it cannot be answered by the bills themselves. Uh, protection of ecosystems. Uh, we have no objection. Uh, in terms of uh, designation, pardon? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just we're we're trying to follow a couple of papers, and I think it's been changed on the main one. So we're relating to different um, ah. alphabet numbers as you were speaking. So yeah, that's what I was yeah, yeah, just trying yeah. to figure out. It's, it's all a little bit. Um, yep. It's all a little bit. Uh, yeah, maybe. How about we all adjourn and get the same okay, the same okay. copy of whatever this is, and um, then we can all be from the same. Okay, cool. Let's take a little adjournment. Don't go too far away, please.
just let us know the same thing you were saying before, but just with us all looking at the same numbers? Certainly, Chair. In respect of Amendment 2, to amend the both bills to make uh, to make points about the designations, we we take a neutral position in that section three is the purpose and principles of the of the bills. Uh, those through standard statutory interpretation apply to all sections within, and so we are talking about a matter of emphasis rather than uh, technical change. Mm -hmm. Four. Uh, in terms of reducing complexity, uh, a comprehensive public education system would be outside of the law, but would be a point well made to the uh, select committee. Uh, and, and that goes for the extensive consultation as well. The simplifying and reducing the steps that individuals and public entities need to take instigate good environmental projects and initiatives. Uh, it would be difficult to object to the objective of simplifying uh, these processes. In terms of the relationship between resource management reform and water reform, we are talking about two highly complex processes and how they interact. Uh, it isn't clear through the bill how those entities will work together in practice. Much of that clarity will come with the regulation that will be done under both acts. So in that respect, uh, there's no objection. Protection of ecosystems. Uh, there's no technical planning problem with any of these amendments. Uh, they're a matter of political judgment as to whether you wish to pursue them. Great, thank you very much. So now um, questions of these amendments, Poe Willis. Thank you while you're, while you're here. Um, in your view, are they necessary? <laughs> From it, it's really expanded what's already there, right? Mm. So many of these themes are picked up within the submission as it exists. The from a technical planning point of view, strictly speaking, they are probably not necessary. However, in representing your position to the committee, they may be avenues you wish to pursue. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Wineta, was that your part I too? Cool. I mean, all right. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor Brown? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tam, it's actually a question for you. So how are you going to break down the votes on the... On this? Yeah. Uh, well, we can take it as one whole unless people want to take things separately. Yeah, I'd like us to do it separately. Yep, so I'll do it when we come to the vote, we'll, um, we can do that. Sweet. Thank um, you. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll move to debate. Councillor Matthews? Yeah, just to speak to these amendments, um, there are, while there is. Question? Questions? Oh, I thought we'd. Sorry, sorry, no, no, we're still on questions. Um, are there any other questions of Sean on these amendments? Cool. All right. Now we'll move to debate. Sorry. <laughs> As you were. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Ahead. I do need to ask. Do you have a seconder? And and would would you like to speak now? Cool, Councillor Randall. No, I reserve my right. Thanks. Okay, sweet. I'm back on. <laughs> um, I'm not inclined. Uh, there is good material in here. There is um, laudable intentions. However. Um, I'm not inclined to support them because it is a lot of content that we have had very late and I don't believe it's good governance practice to vote on such a lot of material on very limited information. And um, as in contrast to the amendments we had on the earlier paper where we have had time to process them, um, I... So on the matter of that principle, I am inclined to vote against them. I also have concerns about uh, amendments put by a councillor where, you know, it's talking about the role of iwi organisations when we have mana whenua representation around the table who are making their own submissions and haven't asked for those changes themselves. So I do have a, a sort of a question about speaking for others when we have become you know, um, much more advanced in our own representation. Um, so, uh, so yes, I, you know, and I understand, I, I thank officers for their advice, but to me it's a lot, 
it's too late. There's probably some things in here I don't agree with. Um, there's some things in here I would agree with, but I, it needed to come to me earlier um, in order to make a good decision, I believe. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor McNulty. Kia ora. I do try and hold myself to a decent standard around this table. I read our papers well in advance. I get Q&As in, and that's really important to me, just from my own performance. And I'm looking at this, and I just, I actually feel overwhelmed. That's what I'm looking here. Again, it is similar sentiments to what Rebecca said. I think there is some stuff in here that's good, but I don't think I'm holding myself to the standard that I would expect of a parliamentarian down the road or a councillor if I'm trying to make a decision on the fly, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm making a decision on the fly. I haven't had the time, unlike Councillor Brown's amendments in the previous paper, where you know there were days to talk about it, sit down in the lounge and actually have debate with Tim one way or another. So I can't see myself... I don't know how I'm going to vote, and I wish there was an abstention button on the remote for once, because that's where I'd be sitting on absolutely everything here. But that's just my personal position on this. Um, and I have seen uh, at the Grants Committee last year, we saw some amendments voted down on a pretty similar lines of basis as well. Um, I think there were wee as amendments for coming through too late. So I think, you know, it's a chance to maybe put a principle about how we want to make or legislate from around the table. So I don't know how I'm going to vote. Maybe someone can give me a good steer on parts of these, but I'm definitely doing it on the fly and without very much context, and that puts me in an uncomfortable position. Thank you. Um, would anyone else like to speak? Councillor Wee neither. Still on the mic. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Just, just, I'd like to echo the thoughts of um, Poe via Liz. Um, just, it, it seems the mover of the motion presented this as measures to mitigate centralisation or, or perhaps mitigate some of the negative consequences of centralisation whilst protecting the environment. And I'm, I'm just simply not convinced, noting, as Councillor Minolti said, that I'm having to basically make an on-the-fly assessment of this content, that they, that they achieve that purpose. Um, I would also note to the mover of the motion that local government has election cycles as well and that centralisation is subject to equally, um, uh, 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 equally currential vicissitudes, if you like, um, to, to, to local government in the sense that we get a job review every three years. Um, the, the, the point by Councillor Matthews is also well made regarding speaking for Māori. Um, particularly with regard to two or four, I believe. Um, and ultimately, I don't feel as if these improve the health of our submission substantially um, when, when considering the bill on which we are submitting. Any other speakers? Uh, me whanau. Uh, yeah. Uh... Like the others have... Um... Um, echoed. I, I really respect what the councillor is trying to achieve here, and certainly from a, um, uh, from her perspective, uh, would agree in, in in many instances. Why I'll be voting against these is that I've I've made it quite clear from the beginning about how we're trying to be more effective governors and effective decision making, um, and ensuring, like uh, Councillor McNulty said, uh, that we're uh, making decisions well informed. I too feel a level uh, of anxiety making important decisions based on on this process, which I, do, I don't think has been that effective. Um, and so I'm encouraging um, councillors to uh, consider that in future, uh, but I do respect the intention. Thank you. Give me a phone. Um, kia ora. I, I must say I do agree with my colleagues. I think we need better process to get to this point. Um, this is my co papa and I must say I've got anxiety around it too, but I will be supporting it because I really understand the intention behind it. Any other pawiwilas? Um, just, just really briefly, I'd just like to support what our Mayor has said and also Councillor um, Matthews. Uh, just my observation has been that since this triennium has started that um, it's been really clear about uh, how the direction of how we want to to move ahead and, and uh, what's happened is that, you know, amendments... Because uh, amendments was... Sorry, Pauiwi, sorry to interrupt you. Um, Councillors, can we just not have side conversations while people are talking, please? So, so I, I think that amendments in the last triennium were like uh, 
what's the way to describe it? It wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, plague, that's it. It, 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 it was a plague, and I have to say, and I used to get really hoha because I kind of felt like um, councillors were trying to rewrite the, the papers through through amendments. So while I understand what your intent is, Councillor Pennant, I am going to vote against this um, based on basically, instead of repeating it all, basically what Councillor Matthews has said and, and, and what others have said as well. Like, I'm overwhelmed with all of this. I'm sure that what what's in here, these things that I I would agree to, but I don't like being given it at, at the last minute. And if I could just ask the chair, that given that seems to be uh, uh, the sense around the table, are we able to put it all in, in one rather than taking them all individually? I'll note that. Thank you. Uh, any other speakers? Cool, right of reply. Thanks. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So if you if you if you're a seconder and you reserve your right, you do need to put your hand up when you want to speak. And Steve, so, that's what so he's doing. That's what I'm doing. Um, the <coughs> and so first of all, just uh, comment. I'm still going to support this. Um, in the end, this submission is is not from officers. This submission is from us. And I think that the things that have been raised by Councillor Pannett, uh, and I'm going to particularly read out the one that. Um, that really struck me, which was the right of appeal must be maintained to ensure the public authorities are accountable for their decision in making significant programs and their impact on the environment is a very, very important message that uh, I think this council should reinforce. And this, these, amend these amendments, even though they are late, they are still uh, an, um, an important reinforcement. As a councillor, uh, and I'm new, um, so, you know, even when I read through the papers, there are things that other people bring to this meeting <laughs> that I don't really think about until either questions or <laughs> debate. Um, they really make me think. And uh, I know that Council Councillor McNulty is sort of sitting on the fence because it's the things that have been put forward to him in this amendment have made him think at the last minute. So the last minuteness, I I understand, and 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 you know, I think it's. It needs to be, these amendments need to be treated from any councillor, um, a bit more than, than, I must say, laudable intentions. They're not laudable intentions. I think they're important uh, suggestions to improve submission. And this submission has, in terms of what the RMA is really doing, and we had the submitter earlier in the, in, in the day talking about how much we're having papers taken away from us. And I think it's an important message that I would like to support to say that um, even if the powers are taken away from us, we need to champion our communities to make sure that our communities are still engaged and able to engage with any uh, such consenting process because it's so important to the proper running of our city and to, and to protection of, our, of all our communities. So I urge you, especially those, to say, <coughs> please, please think about putting aside um, the fact that this was put up late, and I think that is a mistake, and, and I'm going to keep focused on that if I need to do an amendment just to bring it to your attention earlier. But I do think that there's some key messages, especially in part two, um, to uh, uh, and, and also part E, um, which are, are about community participation uh, and about making sure that the message from this council and, and this group of councillors is that we always reinforce the ability of our community to engage in all planning processes in a rich and 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 achievable and realistic way. Because at the moment, um, it could get worse rather than better. Thanks. Councillor Free. Yeah, thank, thank you, um, Councillor Randall. I think actually your um, career over there has been quite influential on my own thinking. Um, yes, the process could have been a lot better, and um, I think it's probably partly that we're getting back into it after the holidays. But personally, when we this is our chance to actually have a say to the government. It is um, our part of the process, and. Uh, I think it's quite appropriate, actually, that people do bring um, amendments to our submissions. It shows, and I think um, Councillor Panner and others, uh, Councillor Brown earlier, who've taken the time to actually think of how the submission could be improved or um, reflect better our views around the table. There's some important material in here, and 
I do accept that I feel a bit overwhelmed as well, not having had a chance to properly match how this fits in with the original submission. But the points that Councillor Pannett uh, is bringing reflects her deep and uh, understanding of environmental matters and the fact that she is concerned enough to put in things that guard democracy, that guard the, the um, environment, I will be supporting her in that. Um, this is just a submission. It's not, uh, you know, it, it would be a wonderful if it had some influence on the government. Um, it may or may not have much effect, but I wish to um, support the things about the democratic process, about the local decision making, about the empowering of communities through some of the things that come in your second part of your amendment. Um, supporting um, you know, the communities with resources so they actually can take part in the processes which they've been able to take part in in the, in the past. I think we're in danger of losing a lot of democracy at the moment in our whole government system. And rightly or wrongly, I will choose to support these amendments to make that point. Any other speakers? A right of reply. <coughs> Uh, thank you, colleagues, for your considered um, responses. It's appreciated. I'm always happy to take feedback. And look, I did send them through last night. I was struggling with it. As someone who has done a bit of work in this area for a long time, I was writing up amendments, getting them across to offices yesterday afternoon, sending them out. It was quite a difficult process because I wanted to write them out So because, because the submission is in uh, so quickly. I'd also just note that it is not standing orders that we have to get our amendments in at any time. We come to the table and we just have to look at uh, something on merit, just as we did with Councillor Foon's amendment this morning, which actually was, was quite a difficult one around the landfill and closing it down. Happy to, because we got some good feedback from our community. I was listening and I was like, okay, yeah, 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 got it. That's a really good one to support. Um, so look, you know, obviously I can always try to be better, but I do think there is a very, <laughs> while that might not be ideal, these issues that I have tried to raise are critical issues. They are not just, oh, are they needed? They actually t attempt to address some of the gaps. We, you know, the officers did so much, but there were still some things that they didn't pick up or they, they needed to be much stronger. So for those of you, particularly my colleagues who, you know, I know are very passionate about the environment, I just would ask you to support at least some of them. And there are good reasons um, for doing that. Just remember, if you are happy for a minister to have authority, you have to be happy for all ministers irrespective of their political persuasion. And that's not what I'm happy about. I've been quite public about that for a long time. I do not want National coming back in and putting a motorway through our city. So I would please just ask that you consider that. It's not a really complex point um, that, um, that that attempt at centralisation, ministerial power, is a very, very, very critical point. One that the Green Party, of course, has been critical of for many, many years. Um, so that's the first thing, that we do, um, that you do support the point around that centralisation. Around designations, though, that is very, very, very important. If you want to be able to hold the powerful to account, the right of appeal must stay, and there must be proper consultation. At the moment, the regional spatial strategies will just allow NZTA and other things to put a line on a map, and then that's it. You can't take any court action. Um, uh, so, look, I'd like to apologise profusely. I, 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 and I, you know, if I'm getting things wrong, I'm losing. You know, I'm learning. I was tr not certainly trying to speak for Ewe. I was just saying, look, if if there does need to be an attempt to come back to the table, let's just bring everyone around the table. That was just all my point because it is complex. And I would challenge all of you too, including myself, if you don't understand these amendments, did you all read the 800 pages plus the bill? Probably not because you had five days. So if you can't make a decision on these amendments, then can you make a decision on the, on the bill? And I feel I've got enough knowledge to do so. I know it's hard for people who've just come onto council because it's just so complex. We need more training all the time. But nevertheless, if you're going to follow that line of argument, you can't vote on this submission, which would be unfortunate, I think. Um, so... There's this further engagement. Look, I think the, the point about water management, uh, resource, resource management and water reforms is a really important point. I think the officer acknowledged that. They hadn't picked that up. Um, I'm not trying to get at the three waters reform. All I'm just saying is, look, Parliament, can you just, you really need to go away and think about how that's going to work. With stormwater, as we're seeing in Auckland, if that is not done properly, you get massive flooding and devastation and death. 
The protection of ecosystem is a fundamental point. This is not a trivial point. I was picking up on the officers talking, continuing to talk about the balance between the environment and other considerations. The environment has to be protected first, and then we will meet every need. Everyone will have a house and a clean environment, but we must protect the environment. Um, and um, the community participation, I appreciate there's some philosophical views about that, but nevertheless, unless we feel absolutely sure, even as decision makers ourselves, that we are always right, let's leave open the chance for people to challenge us, take us to court, test it, to see that we have got it right, because as I said, I come from a place where I've been in front of a lot of decision makers that made bad calls and we're now paying the price. Thank you for your consideration, taking the feedback. Just try and get a bit better, but like these are very, very significant matters and I hope that we can support some of them. Thank you. So, Councillor Brown, you wanted to take some separately. Which would you like to do separately? Uh, I thought if you did uh, like two on its own, four... C on its own for D. We'll, we'll, we'll take it. All good. We're going to take it. All good. Yeah, sweet as all good. Idea of yeah. I was just getting an idea of what we wanted, but we'll do it all separately so that we can get that um, level of detail, and it will be a division. All right. So we'll start with two, and we'll have that up on the screen. And that is carried uh, with the nine voting for. And next we will go to uh, three, which is, so we'll go three, and then we will go three C, three D. Yeah, yeah, so our paper says it's four, but if you look at your screen, it's three. Yeah, four on your paper, three on the screen. So we're going three, just three, yeah, okay. Three, just three. Yeah, we will be breaking it down. So we'll go three, and then we'll go three C, and then we'll go three D. Yeah. Oh, okay. And that's um, carried. So now we're going to go to 3C or 4C on your paper. Four. Like just imagine 4 is 3. Yeah. And that's lost. Uh, all right, now we're going to 3D or your paper 4D. Uh, that's lost. Uh, then we've got 3E, which is protection of ecosystems. Yeah. And is that? Oh, okay. No, no, that's all good. And that's like that on the screen, eh? So if. Oh, yeah, cool. My part is like this. This is the title. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, lost. Uh, next, F. Now, this is a bit tricky because of the way that this is formatted. So, if you just say, uh, Taiho, if you just listen. 
F is designations. So it's, it hasn't been formatted, but look, that's okay, because like we said, we're working with a quick turnaround, so it's nobody's fault. Um, so F designations, A. Eh? Yeah, 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 cool. So F designations, you can see that is um, in the body of text. There's no um, space, but hopefully you can all pick it out. Cool, F, F. And that's lost. And then we've got um, G, which is community participation, which is, you can see that down the bottom. Uh, yep, oh, there it is on the screen. Cool, community, yep, G. Let's go. And that is lost. Okay, so now we're going to move back to the main paper, going back to the RMA submission paper in its entirety. Do I have anybody that wants to speak to that paper? That we've already had the opportunity. Gone. Yep. Any debate on the RMA paper? Okay, I'm going to do a right of reply now. Okay. Uh, I think that was some pretty good um, debate on that last amendment that covered off the pretty key parts of the submission. But I think the most important thing that stuck out to me is that, um, you know, making tweaks to a submission in the format that those amendments were are not the only way that we have influence. We can make our own submissions as individuals to the select committee. We can encourage members of our community to make submissions. We can start up campaigns. We could start a little march or a protest if it's really important to you. You know, don't limit yourself by thinking that the only influence you have is around the table and these tweaks that you make. Okay, so I think that's kind of the key thing that I take away from that whole um, debate. So thank you, Sean, again for all of your mahi, and um, now let's vote on the submission. There are a few minor amendments in there uh, from the Deputy Mayor, and they just encapsulate some of her concerns around stormwater, especially given what's happened in Auckland. So it's like investigating, mitigating measures for stormwater um, flooding. And you wanted some work in there around um, in, uh, sustainability standards for new developments. So those are like standards, um, best practice standards. Two now. So we're going back to the main paper. Sorry, the numbers are a little bit messy. It's just because we voted on the submission yeah, yeah, at yeah, three? Yeah. 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 So what it so I think, um, do you want to scroll to um, the, just the amendments from the amended submission? I'll just read those out. Uh, no, well, you can't now. Oh, yeah, so if you can see on your screen here, it says 3A and B. That, those are the amended, um, that's the amended substantive. So those are the things that have been added in addition to what was already there. And uh, as well as the ones that I got through the past. Yeah, as well as those. Okay, yeah. all right, we're going to vote now. We're going to vote now because we're just going to overcomplicate this. No, Laurie, oh, Tam did, as part of the yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay, all right. I'm going to request that we take this all as one. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, great, let's vote. <sighs> oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. Too many cooks in the kitchen. Councillor Brown? You can't abstain. No. Show some courage. <laughs> One or two. Please. <laughs> and that's carried. Great. Okay, now we need to do the speed paper now because um, people need to leave early. So um, I'm going to ask Brad to come up and introduce the paper for us, and then we'll have an opportunity to ask questions. Yep, which we're going to speed through. And then we're going to slow the cars down, Liz. <laughs> Good. Kia ora koutou. Um, 
you have a paper, it's my pleasure to introduce the paper that's in front of you, which is the revocation of council's uh, speed limit bylaw. Um, I'll uh, give a little bit of background as to why this is being put in front of you uh, today. So um, in 2022, a new uh, speed limit uh, uh, ruling was added to the land transport rule, uh, which uh, enabled local authorities like our council to be able to make speed limit changes. Um, our approach to speed management uh, was presented via paper. Our proposed approach to speed management was presented to the councillors uh, last year uh, via paper um, and in general was uh, approved as the approach to speed management. And so council officers have gone away with that undertaking and have been working on our speed management plan, which will then be submitted as part of the new rule that's in place to change the speed limits across Wellington City. Um, this revocation is removing a piece of uh, effectively bureaucracy that currently sits on our books that is no longer something that can be used anyway as a tool to change speed limits. And that's simply what's in front of you now. It's just a bit of housekeeping and tidying up uh, to get rid of something that's sitting on our books that, that we need to get rid of. Um, I'm happy to give an update on where we're at with the general speed, uh, speed management approach. Um, so part of the speed management approach was around engagement and consultation, which we've uh, we've started and finished the engagement. So as per councillor instructions, we've engaged with the schools around Wellington and got lots of feedback from the schools. Uh, we've engaged with Mana Whenua and got feedback from Mana Whenua around our approach to speed management. All of that's been put into a draft speed management plan. That speed management plan is currently being drafted. Our comms and engagement approach around that speed management plan is being drafted as well. Uh, and we're making good progress along that. Uh, Councillors will see a version of the draft speed management plan as well as uh, have a hearing uh, in, let me just check my notes, um, around April, I think. Uh, April uh, will we'll be with councillors to have a hearing around the draft uh, speed management plan. We're on track to go out for consultation later this year. So consultation on the speed management plan will go out around June this year. And overall, as per the timelines that were stipulated, we're on track to deliver the speed changes uh, by June 2024, which was the end date. So we'll start, we're scheduled to start making changes early in the new year. So by January, we'll start to make the physical changes. By June next year, we should have all the changes on track, all going well as per the schedule that was laid out. All right. Thank Happy you, Brad. Questions, um, questions Councillor Free. Thank you for that update. Um, so we had some specific projects that were actually mentioned in our committee meeting in our decisions of the 15th of September 2022. And some of them were like 30K speed limit for Shelley Bay Road, um, I some more changes in Newtown. I think there was something about Mount Cook, Tawa. Are you saying that those that planning for that is underway? So the, uh, the resolutions that were there were for us to look at the fastest possible way of getting those ones done and whether that would be something outside of the citywide speed change or via the sp citywide speed change to look at the fastest approach to getting those ones done. We've been looking at that. We're now getting into a position where we kind of understand what that would look like. We've identified because we don't we aren't able to use the bylaw that's in front of you at the moment. We've had to establish what process would we have to use in order to get those done outside of the citywide approach. Um, we've established what that would look like now. Um, we've evaluated it and we can achieve doing them outside of the citywide approach. However, it will only buy us an additional few months uh, looking at the overall timetable if we were to pull those out and do those separately through the consultation that's require, required and the engagement that's required in order for us to do that, we'd save a few months outside of the citywide approach. Um, we're still wrapping our head around the timings of that to try and understand what it would actually look like and what complications around um, the, the community's understanding of what we're trying to do would happen if we were to pull some of those things out a little bit. So whilst we aren't quite there yet in terms of being able to tell you whether we're gonna pull those out and be able to do those um, 
earlier than the city-wide approach, we are getting closer and closer to an answer in terms of what that would look like if we were to pull those few streets out. I think there were four of them. And can I just, um, can I ask for some extra clarification? So you, are you saying we cannot use at the moment the bylaw, which allows us to set speeds of 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever? Are you actually saying we're not legally allowed to use that bylaw right now? So I answer the question. Yeah, it definitely are quite uh, correct because that's the reason we um, will revoke the bylaw and follow the new process set by the um, land transport rule, 2022. So, uh, sorry, just to be through the speed sure. management plan, the new speed limits will all be included in the plan. The plan you will be. Uh, considered and uh, adopted by the council. But are you saying at the moment our bylaw is not legally able to be used? At the moment, at right the now, as of today. Yes, yeah, okay. that's correct. Um, whether whether we do this official revoking or not, we can't use the bylaw. So this is simply just uh, tidying up off and some housekeeping. Okay, Councillor Randall. Yes, um, following on, um, if we can't use the bylaw, which I can understand why the paper is in place, it's, if it's not legal anymore to use the bylaw, how will we set a speed on anything if we've got to set a speed on any road between now and the time that speed management plan is fully consulted and then brought before the council and then agreed? Um, in simple terms, what we would need to do is use the, the new rule in the, the land transport rule. So we would be pulling, and this is this is similar to what was in the resolution from councillors, we'd pull a street out of the city-wide approach. We would have to do separate engagement on that street, and we would have to do a speed management plan for that street, so a mini speed management plan for that street. We'd need to get director approval from Waka Kotahi to do that outside of uh, the city-wide approach that we're doing. Um, and effectively, that would just look like us being able to justify why we're doing that outside of, uh, of the other approach that we're doing through the speed management plan. It's not like we haven't done it before. Some of our cycleway projects have d taken that approach as well, where we've managed to pull it out and we are able to justify why we're doing it outside of waiting for the citywide approach. And so long as we can make a strong justification for doing it, we're, we're okay. So, so thanks. Just, just, so just to be very, very clear, I, mean, I was wondering if you could send to me and possibly other councillors the exact clause in the amended act that causes the bylaw to become not legal just just so they can square away you know the point that we're actually running a framework if you like for managing speed in the city that stopped being legal and now you just want to get rid of the clutter if you like is that fair enough yeah i'll, I'll make sure that's sent out to all councillors thanks brad uh councillor panna um, thanks for that. And look, I had a chat to Shu, uh, Shu and Jeff yesterday. I'd understood that we would, because I was worried about a change in government, and they might do something bad <laughs> and stop us doing this. Um, so does that mean we'd need a law change then to bring our bylaw making powers back to then if we wanted to do it? Because I was told by the staff that we could do our own um, change under our own bylaw. We didn't actually need a legislative change. So would need so would it need a legal ch another legal change again to let us use the um, bylaw making powers in the future? Sorry, is that clear? I, I think so. Um, shoot, you answer and I'll just see. <laughs> I think this is um, a question maybe um, we need to consider for the future, but uh, at the moment is um, the Legislative intention is to have only one legal resource for the um, speed limit. Only if the government changes the Land Transport Act, and then your uh, concern or situation will occur. Okay, that's very clear. Thank you. And Councillor Ferry. So we must not be the only council in this position because, you know, that's a, a law that applies to everybody and everybody's got speed um, bylaws. Are other councils going through this process of revoking their speed limits bylaws? Yes, we are very late. Oh, okay. Because our, the, um, the current um, speed data are all transferred to the land speed uh, record uh, run by... Um, so can you give me an example of some of our local councillors who've already revoked this speed limit by law? Oh, I think it's, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we, we can sort that out for you. Cool, thank you. Sweet.
No more questions? All right, cool. Uh, I'm just going to move the paper uh, that we... Okay, you can move the paper, Councillor Bennett. No, no, it's just that I was asked, and look, I look, I thank you for your clarifications because I think just just gentle feedback. It just we could just have a bit more background because I got confused. I thought there had been another change since we agreed it. It just needed a bit of background just on the process. But look, um, this is a very no-brainer change. We just have to do it by law, and then we can get on with the really, really important work, which is lowering the speeds. This will have benefits, not just in terms of reducing the number of accidents and deaths on our roads, but will also make it safe for people to use sustainable transport modes, walking and cycling. Kia ora. Uh, seconder? McNulty, yep, you can second. I won't have any reply, right of reply or <laughs> anything to say. Wait. No right of reply needed then. Let's vote. Cool, and that's uh, carried. All right, uh, cool, a mea noi tato. Uh, unuhia, 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 ki te uru tapu nui, kia wātia, kia māma, te ngākau, te tīnana, te wairua, te ara takatū, koia rā e rongo, whakaeria aki ki runga, kia wātia, kia wātia, ai rā, kuatia.